and we are live. Let's see if I could get things turned on here. Yeah, I can hear myself and everything. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Thanks for being here. We are starting our pre-show for our SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. I'm doing my final checks. And then at the top of the hour, we will start this entire thing going. So let's check right here. We've got the recordings going. That's good. Streaming is working. That's good. Oh, I could probably pause my streaming. I don't need to watch myself. Uh, and other folks uh, are here as well. If you haven't uh, started up our Q&A for today, make sure you follow the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. And when you do that, you can lock in where you are from or where you're joining from anyway. So you can ac actually see that. We're going to see how uh, how we do well. This is our second time through with the VVox, where we're VVoxing. Um, we'll see we'll see how well the VVox goes. Uh, I'm trying to get the, the uh, we did a shakedown cruise of it on Tuesday. So this will be our second time through to really see what's going on. Folks already checking in. Got some folks, uh, once you lock in, let me see if I can put this here. Uh, yeah, that seems to work. So there you go. Where are you joining from in this pre-show? We'll get things going here in just a moment. Folks are in the chat room right now trying to get things ready to go. They're checking in from Panama City Beach in Florida. We've got Birmingham or Birmingham. We got Malk from St. Vincent and Let's Play from the folks in Brazil. Brazil. We've got uh, South Africa and California and Vegas. And we got a lot. We got a lot going on. Thanks for being here. We have all new Security Plus questions for you today, so we will absolutely get those ready to go. They are brand new. Yeah, you have not seen these before, so we'll have to see how this goes. Oh, we've got um, we've got everything sort of lined up here. I'm doing my last minute checks just to make sure recordings look okay, audio looks okay. I'm looking at. The feedback for the live stream, that looks good. We've got a lot we can we can do here. And folks are starting to uh, check in. We've got folks from all over the world who are checking into the live stream. Thanks for being here. Let's see, can I put myself, let's see if this works. Yes, it does. See, we've been doing a little bit of work to maybe make this a little bit better. I've hit the capacity of my current video switcher, though. I have to now. I have to buy a new video switcher. Now I have to get a new one, so I have more capabilities just because of this, just to get that that going on. That's our that is our map chat room. That's our pin map, so you can put a pin where you happen to live. We'll see where people are connecting from. See where that happens to be. We've got a lot to go through today. So we had such a good Tuesday. Uh, which was our Network Plus study group. It was a great session. So this should be really great today. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, there is um, there's a lot going on, isn't there? There's a, there's, there are a few things happening. Uh, have I considered offering an Anki flashcard deck? Um, I have. There's, there's, some, uh, there's already work going on those lines. You must be reading my mind, Mark. I'm already doing some work along those lines. I don't know if it will come to fruition. I'm doing some testing right now, some automation, some batch, because I want it to be something I can easily update and and batch through everything. So the Anki is, is it Anki or Anki? That's what I want to know. Is it the the long or the soft A? That's what I'm I'm interested in. This is me. I've, that's how much research I've done into this. But I have got it up and running. I'm using it. I'm, I'm sort of customizing it right now. I'm uh, testing the import and export capabilities. I'm putting it through its paces. But I want to be sure it's the right thing for what we need to do. Short A. So it's Anki. Anki? Anki sounds weird, doesn't it? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just sounds weird to me, <laughs> which is probably true. Uh, it's Anki. So it is Anki. Thank you. Soft A. It's not Anki. Anki. So it's got not the not the hard A, the soft A. So there you go. I was saying it right in the first place. But uh but it, that is something I am looking at. Because I, I like I like the idea of having additional study materials available in a different way. And we've got plenty of things we could put into flashcards. So um I think it would be kind of fun to do. I think it's that's something I'd like to work on. 
Oh, I think there's uh, there's other projects going on too. So I think um, I think there's there's a lot we could go through. Um, let's see if we can um, break down some of these things. So we'll get that covered. We've got folks calling, folks connecting in from all over the place. Thanks for being here, by the way. We get started at the top of the hour. We've got four minutes and 10 seconds left to get things going here. Should be fun. Let's make sure we've got everything where it's supposed to be. There's there's a lot of work that goes into cleaning my desk. The rest of it is sort of the normal kind of thing, but I have to I have to put things in their place. This is not what this normally looks like uh, to be able to do this. We no longer use or we're not using Socrative today. Uh, I'm not using Kahoot. No, I I have looked at Kahoot, but it doesn't work for what we're doing. So uh, we use this uh, the service you see here. There we go. So that is we're using Vivox today. So feel free to Vivox and Vivox with the this is a Vivox screen that is up. The messages you just need to stay there, um, and we'll see how this works. It's a trial right now. I'm kind of going through the paces to see how this works. Do you have to pay Vivox? Oh yes. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I have. I've already paid them. So, uh, But there is a 30-day thing that they do. So this is my 30-day test. You get to test if this works or not. So we will see. See how well it, it worked pretty well on Tuesday. There were a number of different things that I needed to kind of adjust and work into the way we like to do things. And I think I got through the game changers. So I, I got everything working and looking the way I, I, I'm, I'm mostly happy with. There's a few little things, but there's so little that it's not worth worrying about. And I put in some different uh, feature requests already to the VBOX folks saying, hey, could we do this? And how about doing that? We'd love to do this. Um, and they've been very responsive. Their support's very good. Got right back with me. And we went through a number of different challenges I was having um, and they, they worked it out for me. So, so that's great. I think, uh, that's always nice to have. All right. We've got a lot to do. We've got, uh, two minutes, two minutes to go and we'll get things going here. Let's see if we can, um, get there. You can see, uh, folks in the chat room checking in, getting things going. Uh, I stopped using Socrative because Socrative stopped working. Uh, we, if you recall that from three study groups ago, uh, it wasn't working. So I stopped using it. And I sent them a note and I said, it stopped working. And they go, yeah, we know it's not working. And, and the, the, the not working extended into the weekend. And I had a live stream on Tuesday and I realized very quickly, mm, I better find something that works. <laughs> thought, I thought that would be a big plus for, for the live stream if it worked. So, and I was right. It really does need to work. Uh, so far, I, this is working. So we'll see if it continues to work. Uh, I'm, I'm. Uh, this is a still part of the shakedown cruise for the VVox. We'll see how it works. We'll get there, and I'll, I'll certainly have more information here and and be able to uh, to break that out here. We got a minute to go. Let's go ahead and get our presentation up and running green light looks good presentation looks good this is in the right place this looks okay am i on the first slide let's go back somebody asked what city that was i don't know is it columbus i'm sort of looking at it and sort of off the and i don't remember i've not really been i've been sort of to columbus i've flown into columbus but really not been to columbus um i've so I have to figure that out. Somebody in the chat room will know for sure because somebody's been to wherever that is. <laughs> I'll have to figure it out. And I'm going to go back and look. I do have a list of the equipment. Go to professormaster.com slash studio, and you'll be able to see all of it. There's even a link for all of that. See, Marilyn, is that, I don't know. You'll, I have to bring up the picture of it later on, but we're about to get, get things going here. So I unfortunately do not have that available for you. Let's see if I can get the, okay. That has given me the now. We've got the 12 o'clock straight up. Don't worry, I'll give you all the information you need to get things started. Let me now uh, get things adjusted on my side. Let's put up a graphic 
And let's do a live stream, everybody. What do you think? Sound good? It sounds good to me, too. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the July 2023 Professor Messer SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. This is the study group where I ask you questions that come directly from the CompTIA SY0601 Security Plus exam objectives. And here in this first hour, I'll give you an opportunity to answer those questions live. If you are watching this on a replay, you can follow along with us as well. I think the questions work just as well for doing that. If you are here live and you'd like to join us, Feel free to pop open a new browser window and browse over to professormesser.com slash QA. That is the place you would go to, uh, to find uh, some, a question that's waiting for you right now. Now, there's also an app for this. Today, we are using an app you may not have used before. It's relatively new for us called the VVox app. Just go to your favorite app store and download the VVox app. It's a funny name, VVox app, but it works really well. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, when you get there, it will ask you for a session ID. That session ID number is 103-640-648. Uh, you can also submit questions to our uh, for our second hour at any time during this first hour using the VVox app. And if you have done that, in the pre-show, we were going through and kind of picking out where we are are joining from today. And you can see there's people all over the world that are checking in, that are joining us. Uh, we thank you so much for being here. I have uh, other questions available for you too. Let's try to do some of those questions. I'm going to bring up a question. It's one from last month. So this question from last month is one that I'd like to see if you can remember. It's a test to see if we can really get in and try these questions out. Let's try this one. Uh, let's first, so we've closed that poll. Let's open a new one. There it is. This question that I have is a question that asks, a security admin needs to modify a portion of a system's boot sector. Which of the following would be the best choice for this task? Would it be FTK Imager, DD, WinHex, MemDump, or Autopsy? Now, if you know the answer, you need to either use the link that's on the screen to VVox or go to professormesser.com slash QA. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We will leave that the way it is. But I'm going to come back to this question in just a moment. But please lock in your answer and we'll move forward to have a look at some of the other things that are available. Now I have to figure out how to make my, I only have one way to put my picture in a picture on the screen. I need to figure out how we're going to do that going forward. I think I have. So thanks for being here. We do this live stream once a month for Security Plus. So we, of course, have other live streams we do throughout the week. You can find those all on our calendar. But of course, we have other things that we can offer. Of course, our entire Security Plus course is available on YouTube. You can watch every single video at any time for free. There's no registration. Every single minute of every single training video is out there on YouTube. You can find that at professormesser.com slash YouTube. We also have weekly Security Plus pop quiz questions. You can find those either on Twitter, professormesser.com slash Twitter. And there's a pretty picture version of the question on Instagram at professormesser.com slash Instagram. So good, good places you can go for any of those. Also want to let you know that today we're doing everything from the SY0601 uh, certification. So this is the version number of the exam that you will be taking to earn your Security Plus. We expect that this exam, having re been released in November of 2020, that will retire somewhere around July of 2024. We know that's a pretty good date because CompTIA is at least locked in July 2024. So we know we've got about a, month, uh, about a year now from where we are today here in July of 2023 to pass this exam, which really means you've got plenty of time to study right now. So you should concentrate on the topics we have here today. Don't worry about what happens in the future. You need to get your Security Plus now and get it in your pocket. The exam itself is a single exam. It takes 90 minutes in length. You could get a maximum of 90 questions. You could get fewer than 90 questions, of course. And the passing score you're hoping for, which is on a scale of 100 to 900, the passing score is 750. So you've got a few options available to be able to get to that score 
We'll have to work through other pieces of this. The exam itself, it consists of different types of questions, both multiple choice and performance-based questions. And we will do both types in our live stream today. So stick around for that. Don't forget that not only is my course available for free, but we have additional study materials that might help you. Things like my success bundle. You've got all of the audio, all of the video, my pop. My course notes, my practice exams, it's available uh, either in a physical form on a USB drive or in a digital form that you can download immediately. It also includes my exam hacks ebook. You can find out more about that at professormesser.com slash 601SB. Also let you know that uh, right after this, I'll be putting together the replay. Usually I will have an audio replay available in podcast format that we distribute. Usually I do that in the afternoon or the next day. So usually within 24 hours, you'll have the audio replay of this available. There, You can find out where to go and look at this podcast information at professormesser.com slash podcast and add it to your favorite podcast listening program. If you prefer a streaming service like Spotify, you can, of course, look for Professor Messer on Spotify and listen to the live streams replays there as well. So plenty of places to go to get that replay. There's also a video replay of this available immediately afterwards. It's done automatically by YouTube. You can find that on my YouTube channel at professormesser.com slash YouTube. And if you wait about a day, my marketing manager, Lori, goes through the replay and puts in timestamps into the YouTube video description. These timestamps are clickable, so you can move very quickly and find exactly what you're looking for in the replay, which is very nice. So thanks for doing that, Lori. How you doing? Uh, hope things are going well. We'll talk later uh, when these folks aren't around. We'll, we'll get to see how things are going. This is a great place to go, though, if you need to find something very quickly. And we can go back years to these YouTube video descriptions, which is really great. When we are not doing a live stream, we're always in our Discord. You can join us there along with everyone else who's studying for their A-plus, Network Plus, and Security Plus, it seems. Uh, they are all there. So people will do ad hoc study groups together. Uh, people ask questions in the chat. It's something that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I'm usually in there as well. You can find that at professormesser.com slash discord. We'd love for you to come over and join us there. It's a really fantastic community that we've built um, and not, not something that I've done. It's really what you've done to create the great community. That's at professormesser.com slash discord is the link. i also let you know that uh, eventually you're going to need to take this exam. And if you're in the U.S. or Canada, you can, of course, go to the CompTIA website and pay full price. Wouldn't you like to do that? Or you could pay less than the full price because I have discounts available on my website. All of the vouchers on my website are already discounted. You don't need a discount code. There's no coupon codes. There's no additional extensions you need to load into your browser. Just go to professormesser.com slash vouchers, and you can very easily see what those discounts might be if you happen to be in the U.S. or Canada. Hopefully, we'll be able to provide you with other options, other places in the world as we go through this. If you do purchase the discounted voucher, not only are you getting the, the voucher for a discount, I will give you a copy of my Exam Hacks ebook. This is the ebook that is not available for sale. You only get it with a success bundle or if you're purchasing a voucher. You can find all of this on our vouchers page. Simply go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. That's a good place to go to see if you know what that voucher uh, might save you and have some money in your pocket instead of paying full price on the CompTIA website. Let's go back to that question I asked earlier, which was a security admin needs to modify a portion of a system's boot sector. Can't see it there, can you? There we go. Which of the following would be the best choice for this task? Would it be FTK Imager, DD, WinHex, MemDump, or autopsy. All real things, by the way. I didn't make any of those up. Those are indeed real things. Let's see how you answered the question. 57% or so of you say the answer is win hex. We have about 12.5% that said FTK imager, 16% that said DD, and then mem dump and autopsy with single digits with 6 and 7% respectfully. So the idea is we need to get onto this drive to be able to look at the boot sector. Where would we go to do that? One of the best places you can go is WinHex. 
that's where you can have a look at it. Because in WinHex, you can modify anything that might be on a storage device. You can edit it in memory. You can edit it on the storage drive. These are very flexible and powerful tools. You can really create a lot of problems by doing this. Be very careful when you're making these kind of changes to your system. But this is a very good place to think that, indeed, we may go in and make some changes that might help us with modifying a portion of a boot sector that's on a drive. WinHex also has additional features, like being able to do some type of disk cloning, some secure wipe functions. There's a lot of things you can do with WinHex. And that's the only one of those choices that really applies to this particular issue. We needed to modify a portion of a boot sector uh, FTK Imager is very good for imaging systems, but it does not make changes to what's on a system. We also have DD. Let me see if I can put up the uh, the results, the answers here. Really can't do that from this page, can I? Can't can't see that one. But WinHex is one that uh, DD is one that also does imaging. So imaging and imaging are the first two options that are on the screen. We also have if I show the results. Uh, I can stop that. I can show the correct answer. Here we go. So the folks were asking, where can I see this? Where is this from? And it's from the SY0601 4.1 Forensics Tools is where you would see that from. MemDump is a great tool for be, being able to capture information that might be in memory, uh, but it does not change anything in your boot sector. And Autopsy, a fantastic tool for finding data that might be on a system commonly used in conjunction with an imaging program. So you might use FTK Imager to image a drive and then use Autopsy to go through the image file. That's usually a best practice. Autopsy, of course, could do that, that search on an actual storage drive, but it's very good at going through images as well. In this case, the only one that provides us with the capabilities we listed in that question is indeed WinHex. That is the answer to our question. It's our rewind question from last month. Hopefully, that's one you remembered. A lot of folks did, because I don't think we did that well on the question from last month. So good job. Nicely done with all of those. Uh, as we're going through this, there are there are a number of Super Chats that have come through. You guys are, are just fantastic with the Super Chats that you're providing. And before we go into our performance-based question, I want to thank them uh, very quickly. We've got trying to bring up the details on my side and not doing a great job. Uh, the, the YouTube front end is not providing me <laughs> a lot of details. When it's not my program to show you the results of a question, it's the viewer activity tab on my YouTube. Fortunately, we can just go through and have a look at, before we go to the performance-based question of the month, uh, let's go through and uh, and talk about these really quick because you folks are just being amazing with these. So I thought, uh, well, first, uh, talk about Steve who says, hello, I want to thank you for your help. Passed my security plus on my first try with a score of 751. And Steve, thank you also for the $20 super chat. I'm glad the videos and live show helped. This is why we do these so that you can earn that certification. So thank you so much for your super chat. And we're glad that that worked out for you as well. Uh, let's keep going with more questions. I can, of course, maybe find the next Super Chat. Can I just click on the Super Chat? I can. Uh, Tom says, oh, you need a new switcher? How about a switcher fund with a $10 Super Chat? I don't need a switcher fund. You, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing online, and we're doing fine. We're not collecting switcher fund uh, dollars in the Super Chat. Well, we sort of are actually, because Tom just started it. But that's not why I have the Super Chat. Uh, but I do appreciate that. Uh, thank you also, Justin, for uh, you passed your Security Plus yesterday. Brand new. Congratulations. Thanks to your excellent videos and study groups. Thanks so much. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you also for the $10 Super Chat. We've also got Angel with the $19.99 Super Chat. Passed Security Plus last week. Made it a goal to come back after. Well, thank you. And thank you for your support of what we do here. Um, I'm glad to hear that my material was crucial in helping you pass. And that's what we want. We want people to earn those Security Plus certifications. So congratulations with that. And lastly, Steve, who said, want to thank you for your help past Security Plus on my first try with a score 751. Your videos and live show helped me. Well, you got in there with the 751. I think you studied exactly the right amount, Steve. Thanks so much also for your $20 Super Chat as well. Uh, this, these are um, 
first, thank you for your support. It is not required for you to do that, to be on this live stream, but it sure does help us keep the lights on. And we, we thank you so much for your ongoing support. Let's do some more questions. I told you I had performance-based questions for you today, and indeed I do. This next question on our list is a performance-based question. Uh, by the way, performance-based questions, if you haven't seen these on a CompTIA exam, normally the questions that you would get would be multiple choice, like the one we just did. There was a question, and there's multiple choices that you can select from. Obviously, you can take a guess and still get that question right. But CompTIA wants to make these questions a little bit harder for you. Fortunately, the content of the questions is exactly the same as what's on your exam objectives. So that part is good as well. Uh, I have for you, though, a performance-based question of the month. And this performance-based question is really more of an interactive style question. On your exam, it's one that may be presented at a command prompt. Here, I'm just sort of asking you the question of what it happens to be. So again, uh, you should go to, I'll give you information uh, how you can, can lock in your answer here because your performance-based question of the month asks, from the, command from the Windows command line, display a list of all next hops known to the device. So I'm going to open the poll now so that you can see that happening. The question again says, from the Windows command line, display a list of all next hops known to the device. So this is one where there's a number of different utilities you need to know on the exam. And one of the challenges is understanding on a device where we are right now, what are all of the next hops that we could go to, where we sit on this device, known to this device that we are on. A number of you are putting in some answers. Some of you are putting in the right answer. Some of you are not putting in the right answer. Think about this question and what we're wanting from this particular question. We'll be able to lock this down. Uh, this, this should be pretty good uh, troubleshooting tool. There's a number of different troubleshooting tools you have to know on the Security Plus exam. There's quite a few, actually. Um, it's the Security Plus exam, is, it's big. It's a big exam. So I would highly recommend uh, having a look at this. You can lock in your answer. Go to professormesser.com slash QA, and you can type in what you believe the answer to be. I'm getting some interesting results. I think most of the answers that I'm getting are not correct. So that's an interesting one, a little bit different. Make sure you read through the question very carefully. From the Windows command line, display a list of all next hops known to the device, this device, the one that we are on right now. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. If you want to answer, go to the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. We'll have to see how things go as we step through this. Now, if you've ever been at the command line of Windows and had to work through these, you know that this is a challenge to find where all the next tops might be. Every device... I don't want to give away too much. We're going to wait. I'm not, I almost gave away a little bit too much in, in giving you a hint. So I'm not going to do that. We're going, to, we're going to figure out the details of this as we step through. number of you have put in your answer. Let's see what, what I would have chosen for this one or which one I did choose for this one. The question again asked, from the Windows command line, display a list of all next hops known to the device, known to the Windows machine that you happen to be on. And if you are working through this, you're probably familiar with this option. It's the route option, being able to work through that. The route option tells you everything in the routing table on this computer, including uh, the network that you're trying to reach, the subnet mask associated with that. And then lastly, or not next to last, I next to third to last is the gateway. That's what you would see in Windows anyway. The gateway is the next hop that would get us to that towards at least one step towards that particular network. Uh, we also have the interface that we would leave out of. There's the interface that we would, would go out of. So there's our next hops right there. Uh, that's where we would go to be able to find that particular network. And then, of course, you've got some metrics that allow you to sort based on how this particular network is connected to you. Obviously, the faster networks are preferable over the slower networks. And if there are two next hops that are relatively identical, but they're on different interface cards, we can separate those out 
and figure out the details of this. That's what we were looking for, was the routing table of this device, because in the routing table is where we find the next hop. I think the vat, I would think the majority, I'm not counting up what everyone's doing here, but the, the majority of answers that came through, and we had 122 answers as I kind of scroll through them, uh, a number of you said route. You plugged in route. I think our second highest or, or very close to being the most popular answer was trace route. Um, and trace route's very good because it does show you the hops between you and another device that's somewhere else out there on the network. But that wasn't the question. The question asked us about from the Windows command line display a list of all next hops known to this device. That's what we wanted to know. And so route is really what we would use to be able to determine that because that allows us to see the routing table of the device we happen to be on. If you're ever troubleshooting a routing problem, you know you have to go to one device, look at the routing table, see where it sends you. Oh, it says the next hop is there. Let's go to the next hop. Now let's look at that routing table. Then let's look at another one. We'll just keep going as we step through this. So that's an important consideration, especially if you're doing troubleshooting or trying to figure out where information may be coming from or going to. That is exactly what we would go. So this is really on our machine. Th these are the routes available. That's really what we're asking. Where are all the routes available from our machine? That's the routing table. And there's routing table and everything that you would find on the network that is using IP. So keep that in mind, can really help you determine when data leaves this machine heading for a particular destination, what path does it take and what different options are available. That is going to be able to tell you it's your routing table and be able to, to break that down and see what it happens to be. So I think it was a pretty good uh, performance-based question, if only to give you a feel that some of these could be done at a command line. So make sure you're very familiar at the command line. Make sure you're familiar with the routing table, with the routing in general. For the 601, that's pretty important. So thanks for joining us for that one. Let's do uh, another question, but we're going to jump out of the performance-based question side. And let's have a look at the multiple choice questions again. As always, again, and as a reminder, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. The next question asks, which of the following would be the best way to save energy in a data center? Would it be air gaps, hot and cold aisles, industrial camouflage, east-west traffic, or VLANs? Which of the following would be the best way to save energy in a data center? Would it be air gaps, hot and cold aisles, industrial camouflage, east-west traffic, or VLANs? Now, if you think you know the answer, you can visit professormesser.com slash QA. There we go. This would be good if I put that in there. Professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. As always, please, no hints in the chat room. Uh, we want to be sure we answer it online. Or you can follow the link to VVox and use the VVox app or in the browser Use your VBOX connection there. You've got different options available. So see if you know the best way. Some of these, there may be multiple answers in these. CompTIA is very good at providing you what could potentially, potentially be multiple correct answers in a question. But they always tell you you have to pick the best one of these. So there should be one that is really far and away the best answer compared to everything else, even if technically another answer could have potentially be the right one that we would work through. So lock in your answers. A number of you have put those in now. So let's see how you did with this question. We can see the results. Which of the following would be the best way to save energy in a data center? Would it be air gaps, hot and cold aisles, industrial camouflage, east-west traffic, or VLANs? And we can see that 71% of you say the answer is hot and cold aisles. We also have a number of different folks that have answered about 14% for air gaps. Uh, we've got 8% for VLANs, and then single digits around 3% each for industrial camouflage and east-west traffic. So if we go with that 73%, that's a, a pretty big number of you chose hot and cold aisles, and it's a very common thing to see. If you are someone who's working in a data center, the hot and cold aisles is a very common 
thing to work with. In fact, it's very common to go through the process of working through data centers, and you'll see the actual hot and cold aisles in the data center. So that's a really good example of where uh, you would run into some very interesting problems when you're trying to optimize the cooling in these environments because ever, all of this equipment gets really, really warm, super warm. So to conserve energy, you take all the hot air and put it in one place. You take all the cool air and put it in another place so that you can pull the cool air in, warm everything. There's a better view of it. Uh, and then the hot air goes back into the system to be recooled and then back up through the floor again. Very common way to do it. This is a, a fantastic way to break these down and, and kind of understand what people are working through. But this is this is very common in data centers. And if you have a look at my video on data centers, it's uh, on section 2.7 called Secure Areas. That particular data center video has some very good examples of what those might be. So see if you can have a look at those. It should give you an idea of what different options might be available to you and be able to, to understand what you might see. That's, uh, that is the answer we were looking for, hot and cold aisles. And you guys did really great with that one. Almost 75% of you got that one absolutely right. Let's do another multiple choice based question, shall we? We'll kind of break these down just a little bit. This next question on our list <laughs> asks this next one. Here we go. And this next question asks, which of the following would be most likely to verify the entity requesting a certificate? Which one? So we have a number of choices available. Those choices are online certificate status protocol, common name, registration authority, certificate revocation list, or internet message access protocol. So this is which of the following would be most likely to verify the entity requesting a certificate? Would that be the online certificate status protocol, common name, registration authority, certificate revocation list, or internet message access protocol? Do you think you know the answer? Go to professormesser.com slash QA, lock in your answer. See if you know what it happens to be. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We will instead have a look at what you think this answer is. Now, if you've ever done a uh, a certificate, you've created a certificate, you may have already gone th through this process before. So see if you know what this particular answer happens to be. Certificates can be somewhat confusing if you've never jumped into them before. I find it's one of those topics where it seems like it's very, very complex and convoluted. But when you start looking into it, and you start learning the process and what it does, it's really quite simple, really quite straightforward. Um, there's, and especially because there are very specific things that are done in a certain way, um, which makes it easy if you're trying to learn a particular thing. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asked, which of the following would be most likely to verify the entity requesting a certificate? Would it be online certificate status protocol, common name, registration authority, certificate revocation list, or internet message access protocol. And if we have a look, we can see that 63% of you say that the answer is registration authority. That's what we would use for something like that. So that is the, the, the folks that are responsible for checking and verifying the information that is in a certificate. So this RA, or Registration Authority, is the one that is checking to make sure that the person who is going through the process of getting a certificate is really the person is supposed to be getting this certificate. This is obviously a very, very important person to have this particular case. So this is one where they will either approve the certificate or deny the certificate at that point if it's approved, they can hand it off to whoever's in charge of the certificate authority, and they can create that certificate for them. This is responsible also for someone who may need to revoke a certificate, and they can administratively revoke the certificate that's there. 
Uh, so this is a pretty important nuance. Sometimes the CA and the RA may be the same person, but in larger organizations especially, the RAs are responsible for hunting down and verifying the person asking for that, and then the CA is the one doing the actual creation and maintenance of the certificate itself on the server. So that is why, in this case, the registration authority is the correct answer. I guess before I show that, I should really go through go through that and show you the correct answer that, so that you can see it on your screen. And there it is. That's, that's the correct answer. That's the wrong view of it. There's your better view of it, a prettier view. So you can see that 71% got the correct answer of registration authority. And you can see that this is from my video 3.9 public key infrastructure to be able to do that. Now, a number of you in the chat room said, well, what about a certificate authority? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be the one that did it? Well, that would, except they're not on this list. And then we'd have a problem because it could be the CA, but it's more likely to be the RA. And in this question, it does ask what is most likely to verify. And that really is the, the RA and what they do. The online certificate status protocol is a protocol used to check the validity of a certificate after it has already been deployed into the field. So that is not something that would be used to verify someone requesting a certificate. A common name is the name that is used on the certificate to identify who's doing the request, but has nothing to do with verifying the entity making the request. We also have a certificate revocation list, which sort of is what it sounds like. It's a list of certificates that have, have been revoked. So the certificate is no longer valid, and that list is commonly checked. There's a number of different ways to do that. One of those ways is with the online certificate status protocol, interestingly enough. And then we have an internet message access protocol. That's IMAP. That's a way to send emails back and forth IMAP has nothing to do with verifying the entity requesting a certificate. The registration authority is the correct answer here. And we had about 71% of you get that one absolutely correct. Well done. That was what we were looking for, your registration authority. Well, you can already tell that there is a very wide and diverse set of questions that you might get on your Security Plus exam. And people are even noticing We've already talked about some protocols, some hot and cold aisles. We've done certificates. And of course, there's a lot more. There's encryption. There's management. There are processes and procedures. There are, uh, there's a lot. The Security Plus exam is nothing if not huge in scope. And so one of the challenges I find is that people simply don't have time to go through every single video but they would like the information from those videos to be available. And that's why I created my course notes. My course notes are a way for you to be able to have everything in one single document, they, detailing all of the important text, all of the important graphics, all of the important charts that come directly from my Security Plus videos. If it's in the video, I try to put it into this set of course notes. So this has all of that important information embedded in the notes itself. I have this available not only in a digital format, which is what you see on the screen here, but also in a physical format. And of course, the information on the physical printed book is identical to that that is in the, the digital version that you see in front of you. I will, for example, have I flipped to too far, uh, too far up? I think I have, but I'm trying to get... Get to the page we're looking at. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I'll do this in reverse. So there you go. There's the page, and there's the way it looks in the book itself. So it's exactly the same thing, just in a physical format. Another important note, though, is if you purchase the physical version of the course notes, you get the digital version for free, and you can download that immediately after purchase. So another thing to maybe help you with your studies. And of course, this also helps support what we do here. Having our entire course available for free is great, but after a while, the kids, they need food, and they want clothing, and they want shelter. And I have to tell them, well, let me make some course notes for you so that people can help you with that. It helps keep the lights on here and helps us keep creating even more content going forward in the future. You can find out more about this at professormesser.com slash 601CN for the course notes. Folks in the chat room are saying, hey, are they available? Can we get them in uh, outside the United States? I ship worldwide. All you have to do is go through the process. At the end, it will show you how much it costs to ship to your particular location. And I'll just ship it wherever you happen to be 
in the world. So it makes it makes a little bit more a uh, little bit easier if you're working through something like that. Let's do another question. Let's keep this party going. I've got more questions on this list. The next one is one that asks, which of the following would be the best way to send data to a specific remote port? We're doing a lot of command line type things today, aren't we? This question has a number of different answers. They are netcat, route, grep, dig, and tail. Which of the following would be the best way to send data to a specific remote port? Is it netcat, route, grep, dig, or tail? If you think you know the answer, go to the link on your screen, which is professormesser.com slash QA, or follow the link at vbox.app. And you've got that ID right there that you can type in. There's also a QR code that you can use on the screen that will get you there. And if you click it, it makes it so big you can't even see the question. So I won't do that for you. These are definitely exam uh, all of these different uh, command lines that I have in this answer are command lines you need to know for the exam. So make sure you are familiar with those. And, uh, and of course, there's many others on this exam objectives. The exam objectives for Security Plus are big. And so there are a lot of things to choose from. See if you happen to know what they happen to be. See, uh, this is uh, one that I think a number of you do know. There were people putting in their answer very quickly after I asked the question, because now I can see interactively how things are going on this list. Uh, this question, again, is coming directly from the exam objectives. And uh, although people say, I'm, I'm not familiar with the details of these commands, Fortunately, Security Plus doesn't require you to be familiar with the details, but they do expect you to know what each one of these does and when you would use them. We'll go through this list when we're finished with this, and we'll step through each one of these to see what would be the best scenario for using that particular, particular uh, command line. We'll figure out what it is. So the question again, which of the following would be the best way to send data to a specific remote port? Would that be netcat, route, grep, dig, or tail, let's see how you answered. 50% say netcat, 26% say route, 10% say grep, 9% say dig, and 2% say tail. So that is the answer we were looking for was netcat. At least 50% say that's the answer we were looking for. But is that really the right answer? Well, if we want to take a look, we can see that netcat is exactly what we would use to read or write data to the network. So you can open a port or find an open port and send data to the port that's on that system using the network concatenation tool, which is summarized as netcat. Uh, this does a lot of things. It's a fantastic, very flexible tool. Sometimes you just need to send some data into a port to see what that particular system does. What kind of response do we get? Does it respond at all? When it does respond, what does it send back to us? So this is a good example of being able to break those down. Uh, very often, you can create a backdoor in a system so that you can run a shell from that just by having Netcat available, send the data to that backdoor using Netcat, just a simple way to take data and send it into another system. So hopefully, that's one that you are familiar with. And indeed, that is the correct answer. We had 55 or 54, 55% of you say that Netcat was what we would use. And if you'd like to see more about that is in our SY06014.1 Renaissance Tools, Reconnaissance Tools, Part 1. Renaissance Tools would be something completely different. I guess it would be uh, us working uh, with painting tools. Maybe we're creating some type of, uh, of, of statue. We've got a lot going on in the Renaissance. Fortunately, these are reconnaissance tools, very different. Now, there were other options available to choose from. You've got route. Hey, we know what route does. We're familiar with that one already. 24% of you said, well, we talked about route before. Maybe it's route again. Was it? No. In this case, it would not be. We do not send data to a to really at all using the route command, but specifically not to an open port or a port that may be on a remote device. So route doesn't do that for us. Grep is an amazing tool to be able to search through and find information in a text file. So if you have an enormous file and you're really looking for a very specific word or string, grep is a fantastic way to find that. And it's really, really fast to be able to find that as well. We've also got dig. 
And if you've ever used uh, NS Lookup, then you're already familiar with DIG because both of those effectively do the same thing. They query a DNS server and give you information about the, inform the, the data that's contained within that DNS server. And then lastly, we have TAIL. TAIL is one that uh, sort of fits with CAT, but it doesn't really. TAIL is uh, a command that allows us to see the last section of a file. There's, there's a companion uh, type of command line to this called head. So you can either use head to see the head of the file or tail to see the tail of the file. And tail is really what we would be working through. It's the things that we would be trying to figure out. So hopefully this is one that has gotten you a little more familiar with these particular commands. Make sure you understand what the command is, but probably more important, understand when you would use it. Uh, it's it's not especially important that you know that netcat stands for network concatenation, but it's much more important that you understand when you would use netcat because the questions you get on your exam would be very similar to this one that's giving you a very broad task and giving you specifics and asking you how would you solve this task. So you have to know how these commands work to be able to make that decision, and indeed netcat is what we would use. Let's do another question. Our time is going very well, so we're going to try to fit in some more questions here. The next question on our list is one that asks, which of the following would be the best example of a preventive control type? I know you love control types, so we're going to give you a list of those control types uh, or different scenarios, and you tell me which one of these is a preventive control type. Is it IDS? Weekly backups, warning sign, security guard, or hot site. All of these are real things, but we need to know which one of these would be the best example of a preventive control type. The answers again are IDS, weekly backups, warning sign, security guard, or hot site. And that's where we can lock in our answer. Follow the link on your screen or go to professormesser.com slash QA to answer your question. And we'll have to see if you know what this one is. There's a lot of people locking in their answers very quickly on this one. And I think this is one where knowing the different control types and where we would fit something is very important. But of course, in reverse, it doesn't quite work this way. Right now, we're looking kind of at a one-to-one -one type scenario. But there are devices that could fit into multiple control types. You could categorize them into multiple different types of security controls. Um, and, and that's something I don't think a lot of people grab or capture when they're watching the video on this, is that you could have one device that could exist in two or three different control types, depending on what it happens to be. So have a look at that and see if you're familiar with what these different options are. And all of these, by the way, are some very good examples of different control types and where they might fit. And we'll step through each one of these when we're done here. Let's see how you did with this one. The question asked, which of the following would be the best example of a preventive control type? Would it be IDS, weekly backups, warning sign, security guard, or hot site? And the answer is... Well, we've got a number of different answers. We have a few of you that are, are locking in your answers as 49% say security guard. We've got 8% or we've got 23% that say IDS. We've got 17% or so that say weekly backups. We have 8% that say warning sign and then only just over 1% say hot site. So about half of us say the answer would be security guard. Well, it would be important to know at this point, though, what these control types are. When you say preventive control type, what are we really talking about? Well, in this particular case, we're talking about a security control that prevents something from happening. So it never gets to the point of being a security concern because the control type that we've put in place prevents it from happening. So a good example of those might be a door lock. A door lock would prevent someone from going in and accessing something inside of the room. It prevents access to the sensitive materials that are on the inside. Uh, a firewall, for example, a very good preventive control type that allows or disallows a type of access 
onto the, the network. So it looks at where the traffic's coming from, where it's going to, what application is in use, and it gets to decide whether that, that traffic should pass through. And it can prevent that from happening as well. And lastly, uh, on this list is Security Guard. Security Guard, of course, there are other preventive control types, but the one on my list I have uh, is a Security Guard because they can be in a room as people are coming in and they can prevent somebody physically from passing through the room and going out the other, dis other side of this. So that is where you would focus. The Security Guard's a really good example, as the chat room is mentioning. That could also be a deterrent on what you're, what you're looking at. They could deter the, the, the particular event from occurring. They, they walk in the door. They see a security guard there. They just walk right out. So that's a very good example of how I mentioned that a single security control could be categorized into multiple categories. And I think that's perfectly reasonable uh, to be able to see that and be able to use it. Uh, that is why on this list, we have about half of you, 50%, that say, yep, security guard. That's what I would choose as well. I think I can probably put up the find showing the correct answer on there so we can see it. That comes from my SY0601, Section 5.1, which is all about security controls and having those there. We've got a number of different controls that we can look at. And you can see that things like an IDS would be another good example of a security control that might deter or alert, but would not prevent. So we can't call that a preventive control. I also have got other options here. For example, we have weekly backups. Weekly backups can help us recover in the event that something has occurred, but the backup is not going to prevent that from occurring in the first place. That's not going to help us. Warning signs are very good to deter folks. They can walk up to uh, a building and see, warning, do not come in here if you're not uh, an employee. Uh, and then that person can decide whether they would like to come in or not, but it may deter someone from being able to do that. And then a hot site is another good recovery if something was to break. Those are very good ways to correct a problem that may have occurred, a corrective control. So things like weekly backups and hot sites, I think those fit pretty well into a corrective control, being able to work there. Those are where we would focus our efforts uh, the only one of that list, though, that you could put into the category of preventive control would be a security guard. They're very good at preventing things from happening, and that would be the correct answer in this case as well. Uh, we, we've got so many different options on here to go through, and I think knowing the control types is very important, but perhaps knowing what the control types are referring to is even more important. On your exam, you might get a control type listed that I just don't have in my videos because there's hundreds of different control types uh, or control devices that would fit into those different categories of control types. You have to be able to take anything out there that's a security control and fit it into one of those categories. So that's something you can do, by the way, just by surfing around the internet. You're looking around the internet. You run across an antivirus program. You're going around the internet. You find a utility that can uh, parse out log files. You can find devices that can do different types of recovery and backup. You should automatically be thinking in your mind, what control category could I put these in? What multiple, what single or multiple categories would this fit in? And that might get you a little more familiar with the process of security controls and where you might categorize those. I think that's a good task to go through if you're working along those lines. Let's do another question. I've got more here. There's always another question. The next question on our list is this one. It asks, a new access point was exploited and disabled by an attacker in less than eight hours after installation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this exploit? Would it be zero-day attack, wireless jamming, on-path attack, wireless disassociation, or default settings? A new access point was exploited and disabled by an attacker in less than eight hours after installation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this exploit? Would it be zero-day attack, wireless jamming, on-path attack, wireless disassociation, or default settings? Now, if you think you know the answer, you've got the links on your screen, either professormesser.com slash QA or follow the VVox app link that is on your screen 
and find out what, lock in what you think the answer happens to be. Folks are jumping on these answers today. I'm noticing we got a lot of folks getting in and locking in those answers very, very quickly. I always wonder if that's because we're putting them in different categories or if it's because we really, really know what the answer happens to be. So maybe you know as you're stepping through this. I think that's, that's one that might help you if you're going through the list of these. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asked, a new access point was exploited and disabled by an attacker in less than eight hours after installation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this exploit? Would it be zero-day attack, wireless jamming, on-path attack, wireless disassociation, or default settings? And let's see how you answered this. Well, before we do that, or we'll get the answer, get the question up, and let's see how you did with this one. The answers that you gave, 63% of you say the answer is default settings. We've got 22% of you that say zero day attack. And then we have single digits, wireless disassociation got 6%, on path attack got 3%, wireless jamming got 4%. Those are basically a tie. Uh, really a three-way tie for last place. So the two that really jump out at us is the default settings at 63% and the zero-day attack at 22%. The question, of course, asked that which of the following would be the most likely reason for this, ex for this particular exploit? So let's see if we can break down what we think these are. Uh, let's see what I think the answer is. If I had to choose, I would say probably default settings. You probably left the username and the password as the defaults. You put the device onto the network. And if you've ever plugged anything into the internet, they're going to find it quickly. They are going to know very, very fast if there's a device out there using the default credentials. There are people hitting my website all the time, all day, every day, trying different credentials. And they're hoping to find one that I left open and available. I, I have not. Uh, but they try anyway, just to see if they can work through that. Hopefully, this is a you're familiar with this. If you've ever worked uh, with a new piece of equipment, uh, for example, I used to work for a firewall company. We would install the firewall. And when you turn it on for the very first time, the firewall will tell you, You've just logged in with the default credentials. Now give me a different password. Like you, you even have, uh, it, it doesn't even allow you to use the default credentials once you log in. You are forced to change the credentials, which is a very good best practice, by the way. So that's a, a good example. If you're other Palo Alto Networks folks out there, that is exactly, and many other devices work in a very similar way. Uh, if you don't change those, then your device could be exploited, turned into a botnet, uh, and a lot of other things can happen. Once they control that device, they can have access to your internal network. They can use it for a number of different purchase, uh, purposes. So that's not something you want to run into. The default settings should never be left on a system. Really should be the first thing you change is the default settings because it's so easy to get into a system. And at that point, it's all over. You'll have to really wipe the entire system, start from scratch, and get that system back up and running again. So that would be the right answer. Default settings, we had 63% of you that chose that. We also have the 22% that's at zero-day attack. It's a pretty big number of folks. And if you think about zero-day, a zero-day could have done this. That is a perfectly reasonable technical answer. You could make an argument to say, oh, but it could have been a zero-day attack. And, and you're right. It could have been a zero-day attack. However, zero-day attacks are pretty rare in the big scheme of things. With all the other exploits that are around, all the other things that you could do wrong, the implementations that you get wrong, with all of the other security things that this could be, having somebody leave the default username and password is a much more likely scenario to be able to do that. So, the, the the bad guys use this exploit. The attackers use this exploit against this particular device. So zero-day attack is probably not likely, but of course, it's possible. But that wasn't the question. The question didn't ask which one of these things are possible. It asked which one of these are the most likely reason for the device being exploited. Uh, and indeed, 
default settings really would be the most likely reason for that. Now, we have some other options here that we chose. Wireless disassociation is a denial of service attack that takes advantage of unencrypted or in the clear management protocols on a wireless access point. Newer wireless access points, this doesn't happen to. It's not possible. Uh, but the wireless disassociation is something you have to do in local proximity to the access point. So probably not likely that that's the case. Uh, we have wireless jamming, which is uh, someone just putting garbage into the RF, putting it into the wireless network itself. And this was one where the access point was exploited and disabled. So this is not a case where somebody's simply jamming and making the RF, the radio frequencies, unavailable. This is somebody who gained access to the system and made the entire access point unavailable. And then we've got on-path attack. The on-path attack is one where it's a... It's someone who is in the middle of a conversation and is able to allow or disallow or even change traffic going between two devices. And in this case, that wasn't the case either. Someone really gained access to the access point with an exploit and then disabled the device. On path attacks generally don't do that. You really want to keep the system running so that you can capture information when you're sitting in the middle of the conversation. So that's what we were shooting for. The answer here, indeed, 63% of you were right. It is default settings. If you want to learn more about that, is in my video section 1.6 under vulnerability types and being able to do that. That's what we were shooting for. Those are the answers that are there. And hopefully you're familiar with what those might be, being able to work through them. Uh, the other pieces of this and the ones that uh, you really find are very common uh, are these default settings. There's websites that have entire databases of all of the default logins for any device you can think of. And it's a great way to see, are any of my devices set up with default logins? You could maybe list them out, find the one that you have in your home or your office, and see if it has the default login. You obviously don't want to do that unless you have permission to do that by the owner of the device, or else you may be seen the door very quickly when doing that. Now, if you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit, I would love to send you an email that certifies that you were here for a one-hour webinar category CEU. But to do that, you have to follow these instructions. You go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click the Contact Us link. In the Contact Us link, put your name, put your email address, and in the subject line, please put that this is the July 2023 Security Plus Study Group or something around that. I'll, I'll figure it out based on that bit of text that's in the subject line. And then in the body of the message on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, default settings. Default settings are the super secret code words of the month. And then if you'd like to put anything else in that message, I read through every single one of these. I enjoy reading through every single one of these. Thank you so much for adding the little pieces of information. I like to hear about how your certification studies are going. Did you earn your Security Plus certification? When did you earn it? Uh, what was the process like? And then what did it hap what happened afterwards? Uh, those are always interesting for me to see, and it's, it's kind of a motivational thing for me, too. Uh, sometimes you wake up in the morning, you're wondering, should I really be? Yes, you should. There's people that would like to go through this process. So that's the, what you would do. Go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click Contact Us, put in your name, your email address, the subject line say that's July 2023, Security Plus. In the body of the message by itself, put Default Settings. And then uh, it takes me about a week to turn these around. I think I'm probably going to get these out on the weekend. So if you can get these in today, I'll be sure to maybe turn these around either tonight or tomorrow morning, maybe on Saturday, so we can get you the, the CEU that you're hoping to have in this list, maybe something to go through. Now, I know we're at the top of the hour, but I want to fit in one more question that I have. I think I've got another one here that we can work through. I need to get my face off of this so that I can show you what this particular question looks like. Um, let's see if I have, I had a question here. Let's see, here's the one I wanted to use. Uh, let's use this question that is on my list. I want to, I want to choose a good one uh, so that you can see what it's here. Um, Let's see. This is a pretty good one. So let's choose this one because we were just talking about um, a vulnerability and exploit and trying to work through those. Let's do a different one, but similar. 
if that makes any sense. This question asks, uh, and this is one, by the way, if you've not seen these, I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up with this one. If I can hit my escape button. Uh, there, This is not the only place where we do Q&A with Security Plus. If you haven't seen this before, uh, I want to make you available of my Security Plus practice exams. My practice exams is a book that I created because I just was not happy with the quality of practice exams that were available on the internet. And I thought, well, the only way to fix that is if I write my own. So I created a book that has three 90 question practice exams inside of it. Each practice exam has five performance based questions and 85 multiple choice based questions. It is available not only in this type of form, which is a physical book form, but also a digital form as well. The, and one of the things that I find important is that you have to be able to know what the question is asking, but you also have to understand all of the answers. That's one of the things we've done in the study group so far as we've gone through these other answers that are available. So let's do a question that comes from my practice exams book. Let's see if I can put my myself there. There it is. So this question, again, no answers in the chat room, please. And we'll do this kind of a summary of the book as well. Uh, this question asks... A server administrator at a bank has noticed a decrease in the number of visitors to the bank's website. Additional research shows that users are being directed to a different IP address than the bank's web server. Which of the following would most likely describe this attack? Is it disassociation, DDoS, buffer overflow, or DNS poisoning? Now, what's interesting about these, this book is though, even though it's a PDF, I have the questions in one part of the book and the answers in a different part of the book. And I'll show you, if you just wanted A, B, C, or D, I can certainly show you those. Those are certainly available, and you can go through those. Uh, but there's also a section for detailed answers, and that's what we're going to look at here. Now, one of the things you'll notice is if you, if you mouse over the quick answer or the details, even though I'm on page 15, the details are on page 78. And I guess you could scroll, 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 scroll to 78, but I've already put links in here. So all you have to do is click the word, the details, and it takes you to page 78. Click, there it goes, where it gives you the question again, and then it gives you the answer, which is D, DNS poisoning. That is the answer that is there. Uh, DNS poisoning, it gives you an explanation of why that is the correct answer. So something that would, you can do with this. Now, one of the problems I have with a lot of the questions you find on the internet is I'll get the question wrong, and I want to know why it's wrong. So in my book, I take every single incorrect answer, and I explain why the incorrect answer is incorrect. So that's a, something that I think is important in the learning process, because if you get it wrong, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity to learn some more new information, become more familiar with the exam objectives, and if these topics come up again, you will understand what these topics are referring to. So here, I will give you a breakdown of why it is not disassociation, why it is not a DDoS, why it is not a buffer overflow. And in fact, DNS poisoning is the answer here. This particular question, by the way, is a, is a question that came directly from a local bank. In fact, my bank in, 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 in my hometown, in my town where I live, uh, this happened to my bank. They had a DNS poisoning and people were redirected away from the bank and to a, a website that looked exactly like my bank's website. And people were logging in with their credentials. Uh, and in fact, all of it was sort of hush-hushed. It was very hard to get details on this. They finally disabled it. Uh, but I thought, well, there's a good question to ask. Also, at the bottom of this list, if you didn't even understand what the question was asking, which Got to tell you, it happens to me a lot when I'm reading some of these questions. I put links in here to the video that was used to create the question in the very first place. So you can always go back to understand more about the overwhelming or overlying technologies that were associated with the question. Uh, and they're all listed down here. Not only is a QR code, but there you can click on the links and it will take you to that particular piece that is available. So uh, once you're done here going through this list, I go to the back button that's in my PDF reader. Practically all PDF readers have a back button. Go to the back button and you're back to where you started and you can just go to the next question that's on your list. So having those nice hot links that are in the book can really help you in the digital version. Obviously, if you have the physical book, you just fast 
flip over to the page you were looking for. Of course, the QR codes and everything else are here so that you can still use your phone or your mobile device, scan the QR code, and watch the video associated with it. It's all available in both the physical form and the digital form. So in this case, it would be DNS poisoning. That was the problem we were looking for. Always a bad problem. It's always DNS, isn't it? Kind of the way it works. In this case, these are uh, all available in my practice exams books, another great way. And if you purchase the practice exams and the course notes together, you get a little bit of a break on the price. That's always good, too. So you may want to consider that. Find out more on my website, professormesser.com slash security PE to be able to do that. So folks in the chat room are saying, well, why is it a PDF? Why isn't it something else? Why isn't it some type of engine? Well, if it was an engine of some kind, I would need to give you something specific to the platform that you're using. Is it iOS or Android? Now I have to make two of them. Maybe Windows, we'll make three of them. Maybe Mac OS, we'll make four of them. Uh, and then maybe, no, we'll just do it online. Everybody can do it in your browser, except then you'd have to be online. With a PDF, you can be anywhere. All the information is available regardless of what platform you happen to be on. I want to make all of this information available to everybody, and that's why we chose that particular format to be able to do that. It, it works on every platform you can find because it's a PDF. Just, just as a great benefit to have that level of flexibility with that. So plenty to work through. Hopefully, you were familiar. It's all, if you thought it was always DNS, then you got that answer right because it's always DNS, isn't it? Well, that brings us, I know it's a, we're past now an hour of Q&A, but we're really not done yet. Stick around for the after show. I'm going to take questions from the chat room. Maybe you've even submitted questions already for the chat show, uh, for the after show. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you're aware that the exam objectives for the Security Plus exam are absolutely free. You can download them from the CompTIA website directly. You can either go to your favorite search engine and type in CompTIA exam objectives, or you can follow the link that's on my site at professormesser.com slash objectives. It's another great way to get it. It's a free document, and it tells you everything you need to know to pass your exam. If you've never seen the objectives before, they are extensive. This is not a summary of what's on the exam. This is a detailed overview of everything that could possibly be asked of you on the exam. And I know that some people will point out there's a, a section in here where they say we could go outside the scope of this and ask something else. Yes, they could, but they never do. So if you know everything that is in this document, I'll tell you, you're going to pass your exam. That's how that's how how I feel about the specifics of and how important this particular document happens to be. So get these uh, exam objectives. They're available for free. Go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and the link will take you over to the CompTIA website. We do one of these study groups every month. I've got another one scheduled for October the or August the 23rd. Can you believe August is coming up for our next study group? So uh, come on back for August. We've also got other study groups happening throughout the month of August. On the 8th and the 10th are my A-plus study groups. We've got a Network Plus study group on the 16th. And on the 23rd is our Security Plus study group. In the meantime, when we're not doing the study groups, come on over to Discord. There's always somebody doing some Q&A and talking about other things as well. Well, although it's, we're finished with the part where I ask you questions, we're just now about to start the part where you ask me questions. So stick around for the after show, and I'll take questions from you about certifications, IT, career, or anything that you would like to ask. We also have plenty to look at when we are not here live on our Twitter and our Instagram with our weekly Security Plus pop quiz questions. And of course, all of our Security Plus questions are available on YouTube. Don't forget about the voucher, discounted vouchers available if you live in the U.S. or Canada. You can find that link on my website at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And of course, my course notes, practice exams, success bundles, and more can be found on my website either from the menus from the pull down, or you can find them at professormesser.com slash security CN. Well, thanks for joining us in this first hour. Don't go anywhere. Stick around. We'll be answering a lot more questions coming up in the after show. In the meantime, thanks for being here. And we'll see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Okay. Let's take a sip. Let's bring this back on. Let's get ready for some QA in the after show. QA process in the after show is going to work a little bit different 
than some of the things you may have done before. So we're absolutely going to step through those and be familiar with what those are. So let's let's go through the list of things that are here and be able to break down what these are. Let's uh let's first let you know what the process is for being able to work through one of these. So I'm going to bring up this process on my screen so that you can see what these are. Uh, there are questions available on um on the VBox app. There's a way to submit questions on the VBox app. So I'm going to bring up that Q&A board and have these questions. A number of you have already submitted questions into this list. And I'm going to hide that piece. And I know it says the session has not started, but it really has because I have QA right here. And I'm going to enable the QA that's here. I have my, I have my notice up. Does the manage announcements not not have the announcement there? I guess not. Uh, the way we would have this is in the polls, and it says the session's not started. The session has absolutely started, and I have a list of the Q&A that's there. You can go over to the Q&A button that is in that list, and we'll go to these. In fact, I think I can, I can do these and have these worked uh, on this different list. We'll, we'll have one of these um, and see which ones you may have uh, this this is this is something that happens as well. Let's start with one, for example. Let's see if I can publish this and have it show up on the screen. There we go. We have. Uh, we'll start with this one. So I think we should have a have a good luck session for uh, Kamal, who is has their Security Plus exam in 15 hours. So here it comes, uh, folks that are working on your Security Plus exam. This is a great place. Uh, to work through. I think if you're someone who is working on the exam, it's a big exam. It's a mass, it's a massive exam. If you've never worked with the Security Plus exam, it is extensive uh, and being able to work through. So uh, best of luck with your Security Plus exam and for everybody else who's working along those lines too. Also want to thank, uh, before we get into more of the questions, Michael McKinney with the $50 Super Chat who says, thank you, Professor Messer, for your videos and study materials. Pass the Security Plus on J July the 6th of 23, unless you're from the UK and then you p passed it on June the 7th. Either one of those is still good, though. You got your Security Plus. Thank you also for the Super Chat. These do go a long way to keep the lights on. And uh, what's more important is you got that Security Plus certification. So congratulations. Uh, thanks so much for being here and telling us about the Security Plus certification that you got, which is um, always a good story whenever we hear folks that are talking about what they are doing. If you want to submit a question, we've got those in the VVox app. You can go over to the VVox app and plug in what you think that question would, what you think you'd like to submit for a question and have those uh, on the list. Uh, speaking of which, we'll have this one that uh, is questioning the uh this particular part of the practice exams. How do you know your practice exams are so close to the real exam? Uh, that's the first question. Well, I, I have designed and written every single question that is in my practice exams book. So first I know because I wrote them um, and I designed them to have a similar voice, to have a similar style, to have a similar way of writing uh, as the CompTIA questions do. So the way that I know they are so close is that I wrote them. So this that's one of the things that's really important to me is the quality of the questions and the materials that you're getting. And really the best way for me to make sure you're getting the highest quality questions is that I'm the one creating them. Because I if I create them, I know if they're good or not. I'm not going to throw something over to someone else to write who's just pumping out questions for quantity. Uh, you need questions that are quality questions, that are written in a way that's going to prepare you for the exam, not only in the topics that you need to know, but also in the style that's presented to you during the exam. Second question here is, have you ever had a question on a study group with 100% correct? I want to say we have, right? It's not, it's not common. I feel like I failed if I give you a question where we get 100% correct because it's a study group. We need to learn something from this. And by the way, the only way you learn is when you get something wrong. So I want, I, 
I don't, let me rephrase that. I don't want you to get something wrong. I want you to get these right. But I also think that it's important for you to be challenged when you go through these questions. Ideally, I'd like half of you to get it right and half of you to get it wrong. That's what I'm shooting for when I create the questions and the answers. Um, so it does take some time to go through that process. And this indeed is, is the way we kind of focus on those and work through those. Um, let's see uh, other questions that you might have. I want to pop open another set of these that may be available. Um, Let's go through the different list of these. I'm going to just simply step through everything you're submitting. We have a lot of questions in the review queue. So keep putting them in there. Keep adding the questions. I may be able, I was thinking of creating some YouTube shorts of these. So if you have questions, I'll be looking at these afterwards. Maybe we can put some out on the YouTube website as well when we have some ex extra time. When we have some extra time, I made myself laugh. There is uh, other questions. Um, this one is more of a, a strategy type question. Uh, and it asks uh, on this list, this is from Robert, who says, uh, do you recommend studying by the numbers and going straight through the exam objectives? For example, start at number 1, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and going straight through those? Or would you recommend finding material that breaks up domains into similar topics, subjects, materials? And it's a different perspective. It's a different uh different approach to dealing with studying. And what you're going to find if you've ever looked through the CompTIA exam objectives is that the objectives do put things and group things in similar or similar areas. Let's see, I have one. Let's go back to the exam objectives. So let's let's get an example of this. I'm going to go all the way back to section 1, which is the domain called threats, attacks and vulnerabilities. Let's see if I put this in a in a form that would let this flow a little bit better. Here we go. So I can zoom back out again. So this first section, 1.1, has uh, the first section is compare and contrast different types of social engineering techniques. So everything that's in this section is one dealing with social engineering techniques. For example, phishing, smishing, vishing, spam, spear phishing, tailgating, whaling, hoaxing, pretexting. Uh, and then you've got the principles. The social engineering principles are in this list. So everything in this section is about social engineering. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is the first th thing that's offered to you in the exam objectives. This is the first bit of information. But we sort of jumped right into it, didn't we? There was no precursor. There was no discussion of, of what... Um, security means in the world of IT. And in fact, I even consider these to be kind of backwards. What you want to know the principles of social engineering first and then dive into what the individual examples of social engineering might be, maybe that would be a better way to learn. And that's why it's, it's sort of a, a balancing act that I have. Because if you pick up a book on Security Plus from any author, from any publisher, and you look through the book, 99.99% of these are going to be in a completely different structure than what's listed in the exam objectives. And the real question that a lot of people have is, is that good? Should we have a book that's bouncing around into different parts of the exam objectives? You might, because the author may have found a flow that they feel works better for learning the materials. Um, now, most of the time, the book is going to have some type of, of appendix or section that cross-tabulates the chapter of the book to the exam objective numbers. So you've got a little bit of different things to pull from. Um, and that's useful because then you can cross-reference. My videos, though, I feel that my videos, ideally, everyone would go through every video. But the reality is people are hopping into the videos, finding what they need, and they're hopping out. And in that particular case, I need you to find what you're looking for very, very, very quickly. And so what I do is put them into the same order as the CompTIA exam objectives, just because it's easier to find those. And I think that's that's probably the, the best way that I could do it for this particular format. But if you pick up a Security Plus book, it's probably going to be in a format that is very different than the exam objectives just because the authors decided this is a better way to do it in their mind. And they're probably right. They're probably, it probably is a better way. The objectives I don't find to be in a, a very 
good order to learn from, I, ironically, but it's a very good order if you're looking for something. So that's the balancing act I have to deal with. Kind of, uh, the very first course I ever did, just as an aside, the very first course I did was an A-plus course, a 600 series book uh, or series video series. And I did what authors do. I looked at the exam objectives, and then I put things in the order that I think were the best way to learn. And what I found very quickly from that first course, it's not a great way to find anything. Because then if you want to do that, you're in, you're in trouble at that point. How do you even find those things on your system? So uh, it was much better for everyone if I put them in the same order as the objectives. And that's why I do it that way. And that's why authors do it their way. Both are good ways to do it. It's just there's a, there's a cross tabulation that has to take place between both of those. And it's really up to you as to how you're going to work through all of that. Uh, other questions. Let's keep uh, going into these. Uh, there's more in this list. Um, so here's a, here's a good question. This one's sort of a security plus question. Gives me a chance to also talk about why I believe things are set up in a particular way with all of these. So let me first uh, clean things up a little bit on my screen. And let's bring you to this next question that asks, hello, Professor Messer. I'm new to IT and cybersecurity. Do I need to memorize all the port numbers or any mnemonics that might help? Also, are there certain port numbers that come up in the exams we should remember? Well, if we're talking about questions, especially questions that are in the A plus or network plus, port numbers are clearly listed in the exam objectives. You need to know port numbers. Uh, and in fact, they give you the list of port numbers that you need to know. You don't need to know 100. You need to know the 20 or so that they list in the objectives. But if you're talking about Security Plus, let's quickly go back to the exam objectives. Let's, uh, let's have a look at all of the port numbers that are listed in these exam objectives. So this is section one. Um, OK, there's there's no port numbers in section one. Oh, well, maybe let's check section two. Let's look at all the port numbers that are listed in section. No, there's there's no port numbers there either. Let's look at section three. Section three is when uh, we'll go through the port numbers because that's implemented. No, there's, there's no port numbers in section three. Uh, how about section four? No port numbers in section four. Last section, section five. Domain five has a total of zero port numbers. There are no port numbers listed in the CompTIA exam objectives. And if you follow my rules for knowing what's on the exam, you need to memorize exactly zero port numbers. Or at least if you were trying to optimize your study time, you would be instead studying what's in the exam objectives and not studying things that are not in the exam objectives. So that is why and I, I go through that relatively ridiculous process for you because people will constantly provide or ask the question, uh, what are all the port numbers I need to know? Well, according to CompTIA, the answer is zero. There are no port numbers you need to know. And if you look at other study materials, they'll give you 100 port numbers for Security Plus that you need to know for some reason. Um, the thing that is, here's your overlap. But here's why this is mentioned. Because, and here's where sort of outside the scope of things, if you look at the requirements for the Security Plus exam, and I'm going to go back to the course notes because that's where the requirements are, they talk about who should be taking this exam. So let's let's have a look at the requirements. CompTIA says that the recommended experience is at least two years of work experience in IT systems administration with a focus on security. This is hands-on technical information security experience and a broad knowledge of security topics. So they're not expecting that you're going to jump into this exam with the knowledge, with no knowledge at all. They're expecting you to jump in this exam already knowing what's in the A plus and Network Plus, at least to some degree. So there might be four or five port numbers you need to know. Some folks have even listed them in the chat room recently. You need to know port 80, you know port 443. You probably already know those. That's for HTTP and HTTPS. You need to know 22 for SSH. That's pretty good. There's some others maybe. That's about it. That's, there's some others that are in that list, but uh, the, the broad ones, maybe DNS. DNS is a good one to know, port 53. But that's it, like four port numbers uh, because you should already know them. 
but they're not listed in the exam objectives. Now, some people take my negativity towards this or seemingly negativity toward port numbers as you should never, never study port numbers. That's not necessarily true either. But if you had to make a decision, you're running low on time, you have in the Security Plus exam objectives over a 1,000 objectives that you need to memorize and know from that enormous list that we just looked at, well, where do you spend your time studying? Do you spend your time studying something that's not listed in the exam objectives? Or do you spend your time studying something that is listed in the exam objectives? I guess if you wanted to have the best of both worlds, you study those four port numbers and then everything else. That's probably the best advice I can give you. But if you're short on time, don't worry about something that's not in the exam objectives. Stick to the objectives. As I mentioned before, if you know everything that's in the exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. That's our goal here. Eventually, you're going to need to know port numbers just to just to do this in, in life. Uh, but it's expected as someone who's in the industry, you've worked up into a level of security, you already know port numbers. You're already familiar with this. It's already your thing. The problem, though, is some of you are taking Security Plus as your first exam with no experience because that's what the federal government, in, as one of many, have asked for. So it's, it is a bit of a misnomer, a little bit of an ironic thing that you need to know some port numbers for things that could appear potentially on your exam, but they aren't listed in the exam objectives. It's one of those rare times where something like that might happen. So become familiar with those and you're fine. I think those, if you know those four, you're good. But the reality is, if there was a question that came up on the exam that had something to do with port numbers, you could, and you didn't know the port number, you skip it and you keep going, you already have memorized everything else in the exam objectives. So you get one question wrong. I think I can live with that. I think from the from a test person's perspective, working through the details, I think I'm fine with that. So that's what I would recommend too. Make sure you you spend the time doing the things that are important for you to pass this exam. And if you can allocate some additional time for port numbers, that's fine. If you can't, just ignore them. Stick to the exam objectives. That's my strategy. Uh, other questions. Let's keep going through this list and what other people are looking at. Um, so this is uh, this should be pretty good. Uh, and I think this is a good one to sort of a jumping off point. We can talk about some other pieces along these lines. Um, and, I, and I have good news uh, for Rod, who asks, how appealing is an AAS in cybersecurity to hiring managers? Did I waste four years of my life well, no, because you didn't get a business management degree like me, uh, which really was not a waste of four years. And, and I will tell you that a formal degree of any kind is very valuable in IT. And I really say of any kind because it's true. I've worked with people that have had liberal arts degrees. I have a business degree. Other people I've worked with have had engineering degrees. I've worked with masters and PhDs. And in the case of an AAS in cybersecurity, that is a very focused type of four-year degree. Hiring managers would be delighted with that. Uh, the challenge, of course, and I've mentioned this before, is that the, the problem is finding someone who um, will look at that as a potentially entry-level security position because there are not a lot of great entry-level security positions. Um, most security positions are, are higher up. You have to have a good knowledge of operating systems, of networks, and other components to be able to even qualify for getting your foot in the door in the world of IT security. So I think that's one where if you are trying to figure out what is the right thing to do for me. I have a video. It's in the YouTube video description of this video that you're watching, which is how to get a job in IT with no experience. And I tell you, there's four things that are important for you to bring to the table. One is, I'm going to skip the first one, but one is uh, certifications, industry certifications. We're talking about those today. Those are important, especially if they're asking for them in the job description. Uh, having some type of practical experience Maybe it's a home lab. Maybe you've done some work volunteering somewhere else. Maybe you had an internship, but something where you have applied these things that you have learned and you can tell other people how you have applied these things. Doesn't even have to be a job, just experience. Does not have to be professional experience, just some type of 
practical experience. And the third on the list is you know someone who works there. Uh, it's something we often don't talk about, but it's incredibly important to be able to um, to walk in the door and say, oh, yes, I'm already familiar with your organization. I have known this person for years from, from a, a Cisco user group, from a Microsoft user group, from they're in my uh, church. They are, I met them at their, from, they're in my kid's school. You know that person who works there and they can vouch for you. That's, that's really valuable when you're in the job hunt. We, we skip over it sometimes, but it's a very, very powerful thing. And then the last one, really what I put as the first one on my video, a formal degree. You have a four-year, a two-year or a four-year degree. You've gotten some type of diploma from a school that says you have done this. And whether it's something that's relating to technology or not, hiring managers love a degree. They, they continue to love a degree. There was There's a lot of talk in the industry about do we get a degree anymore? Do we care about degrees? Are degrees important? Those are good conversations to have. But currently, hiring managers love degrees. And, and I think one of the reasons somebody said uh, when they were talking about a degree that was on their wall, it said it doesn't say that you know this. It just says that you put up with this for four years and you were able to stick it out. <laughs> And that, that goes a long way for someone trying to hire someone. You applied yourself, you stuck to it, you excelled enough at it that a third-party organization gave you this thing that said, you spent four years of your life, that is a valuable thing, and you should show this to everyone else because, indeed, it is not a waste of four years of your life. It's a very, very powerful tool that you can use to help get you a job, along with all of those other elements that I just mentioned. So I don't think you wasted your time at all. In fact, you you have a degree that's a technical degree. It's fantastic. Whether you're able to apply and use it and directly use the information that's in there today, maybe you will or maybe you won't. But at, at some point in your IT career, those things that you learned as part of that degree and the fact that you have the diploma will actually help you. You may not even realize it today, but it will help you uh, if not today, certainly in the future. And my even my management degree, my business degree with no emphasis in information systems or that's what we called it back in the day, uh, or computing or technology or security or any of those, even though I didn't have that, I still had the four-year degree from a relatively good school. So I think that's something that can help you too. Uh, other questions. Let's keep going in this list. Um, we talked earlier today, there were a number of questions we did where there were um, command lines in it. And this question sort of fits that command line question. Uh, this, this person asks, hi, I understand there are quite a few commands we need to know for the Security Plus exam. Yes, there is. And you know that because you've already downloaded a copy of the CompTIA exam objectives. The question continues, I was curious exactly how in-depth we need to know these commands. For example, Netstat, great example, by the way, has quite a few flags. Yeah, like 100. If you ever look through the Netstat uh, manual, do a man Netstat at your uh, Linux command or look at the Netstat details. Uh, it is Netstat-A. Or do we use Netstat-R? Or do we use Netstat-E or dash S or dash N or dash... Go on, go on, go on, go on. The question, ultimately, if you didn't realize where this was going already, do we need to be aware of the different types of flags for each command? Well, at that point, uh, I don't get to decide that. Uh, but CompTIA does, fortunately. So let's see what CompTIA says is the appropriate thing with these commands. We're going to flip over to Section 4, and we're going to have a look at the exam objectives themselves. So section 4.1 says, given a scenario, use the appropriate tool to access organizational security. So already there's your scope. They aren't asking you to know detailed flags and configuration settings for every single one of these. They say, given a scenario, which of these tools do you use? Okay, that's, that's actually reasonable, especially when you consider that all of these different bullets that are in this section of the page are all commands you need to know or utilities you need to know. Um, so if you look at the first group, for example, traceroute, nslookup, ipconfig, nmap, ping, 
HPing, Netstat, Netcat, IP scanners, ARP, Route, Curl, the Harvester, Sniper, Scamless, DNSC Num, Nessus, Cuckoo, Headtail, Cat, you get it. There's all, imagine having to memorize all, you've never used these before, and now you have to memorize all the flags. That would be crazy. Now, you'll notice how many flags are listed, how many different options are listed for these commands. None. There's zero here. So we're not at the point with this exam where they're really asking you for a lot of detail. What they're really asking you is, let me give you a scenario and you tell me what command to use. And you've noticed today that all of the questions that dealt with a command line or something that was command related, I gave you a very high level scenario that we have to work through. And then you have to pick the right one on that list. So that's what you really need to know. Now, it is important that if you look at DIG, that you understand that's the Domain Internet Groper. What an awful name. But that's what the abbreviation is. That actually doesn't tell us what it does, though. And you will never get a question on your exam that says, what do the initials DIG mean in the command DIG? They'll never ask you. But that's such a typical flashcard question, isn't it? DIG, uh, Domain Internet Groper, ding. Well, that's great that you know what the name is. And sometimes that's useful because that name might tell you what it does. But in the case of DIG, it doesn't really. It doesn't tell us a thing about what this does. It'd be more useful on your flashcard, for those of you creating flashcards, if you put DIG on one side, on the other side you put Domain Internet Groper and then an explanation of what that command does and when you would use it. That's what you need to know. Flags, options, uh, different configuration settings, not important as far as Security Plus is concerned. But it is important that you know when you would use that, how it's used. What the In fact, another one is sort of the reverse of that. Here's the output from the dig command. You just don't know what it is. And they ask you, what created this output? Where did this come from? Look at all this information on the screen about DNS information. What created that? And it's important that you have a familiarity enough with that utility that you know what created that. It, so understanding and having to deal with netstat, dash A, dash R, dash E, dash S, dash N, all of those, you will use those in practical terms when you start using netstat. But for the purposes of the Security Plus exam, don't worry about it. You're going to be just fine not knowing all of those different flags and options and other pieces that are there. So that part's, in my mind, that part's super great. So I don't have to study at least that level of it. Uh, focus on what it does. Don't necessarily focus on the intricate details of using it in a practical way. Uh, there will be plenty of time, by the way, when you need to do that, when you need to practically uh, use those. So that's 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 super important when you're working through the pieces of these. Uh, let's keep going through this list. We've got another group of folks um, that is that is worried about these. Here's a, a common question. I think this is a good one to go through. A uh, short question, but it sort of talks about uh, the details of this. The question asks, can uh, can you go over how to approach the performance based questions? What is the best way to study for them? Well, performance-based questions, as I mentioned earlier, are simply a different way to ask questions that are topics that come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. So it's not that they're asking you for something you don't know. They are already listed out. Let's go back to our exam objectives. Here's what you need to know. Go back to section one, section two, domain three, domain four, domain five. That's what you need to know. Now, they could ask you the information that's in these exam objectives, either as a multiple choice based question, or they could ask you in a different way. And that's all a performance based question is, is simply asking you things you already know in a format that's different than a multiple choice based question. That's it. So I would recommend you don't worry about what the, the, the structure is or how it's going to be posed to you, if you know everything from the CompTIA exam objectives, you've already studied them and you know every single bullet, 
really doesn't matter how they ask the question. You will know the answer. Is it drag and drop? Is it matching? Is it fill in the blank? Is it do something at the command line? It doesn't matter because you already know how to do all of that. You've already studied the objectives and you know how to apply them. So uh, when I tell people and they're very focused on, I'm worried about what they look like. I'm like, don't worry about it. You already know under, underneath all of that what the content is. You already know all the materials that are being asked of you. It doesn't matter how they ask the question. This is just another way to ask questions. It's it's almost like uh, what if they all the time we were um, we were providing questions that were matching questions, and then suddenly they go, and now we're going to do a new type of question called multiple choice. I feel like I get a bunch of questions like, how do we prepare for multiple choice? <laughs> the same way you prepare for all the others. So don't worry about how the question is asked. Worry about what's in the question, and everything else will take care of it from there. Now, we do a performance-based question. It's our very first new question of every study group. You could go back to every study group in the last 12 months and look at all of our performance-based questions. Um, though That's one way you could prepare. Uh, I've also got performance-based questions that are in my book. These are different than any of the questions we do in our study groups. So these are new ones you haven't seen. And there are three times five. So you got 15 performance-based questions in this book. Um, after a while, though, they become very familiar to you. The structure of the questions, how they're doing, they're matching questions. They are questions that are drag and drop. They just become very familiar. And it's pretty much what you could expect or think to expect on an exam and working through the details of the answer. Again, I don't think uh, it's the format of the question is important. I think it's more important you study the exam objectives. That's my my recommendation anyway. Let's do some more questions that you're submitting. You guys are putting in some great questions in here, by the way. I'm flipping through and seeing some of these that are here. So, uh, so thank you. There's another one about uh, the performance-based questions and interactive questions from, from uh, Chase. So I'm going to uh, sort of a duplicate. So we're, we'll archive that one and send it out. Um, let's have a look at other questions. This is um, this is a pretty good one. Um, and this is a very common one. And I'll, I'll explain my, my approach to it as well. We kind of step through it. Uh, this is from Kim that asks, uh, do any of your study materials include some sort of calendar Biggest hurdle with my studying has been managing my timeline and using it widely. I have exactly the same problem as Kim, which is staying on topic and staying on your schedule. It's such a challenge. I have, I have toyed with the idea of creating a uh, get your A+, plus, get your network plus, get your security plus in 90 days, get your security plus in 60 days, get your security plus in 30 days, and creating some type of guideline and learning method that we could use during that 30-day period, 60-day period. I think it's 90 days seems more appropriate. It seems to be the average. Between two and three months is really what we do. But everybody has a different schedule. Some people are able to schedule and get one hour a night. Some people are able to get eight hours a day of studying. It just depends on where you are in your life and what things are surrounding you that you had to kind of break these things down. So I ultimately have not created a stick to it 30 day, 45 day, 90 day plan or whatever it is, because as soon as I create that, other people are going to go, yeah, but I only have an hour a night. Can you do a six month plan? Which is what I like to do. I like the six month plan of certifications. Um, and, and then we'd be creating a different plan for every single one of these. So instead, I think it's probably best that we use a different approach that's not so time-centric. Now, if, if there's something, I guess there are scenarios where somebody has said, I, I'm starting a job in two months, and they say I have to have my Security Plus in two months. So I could see how a calendar might fit that. But I would say for the vast majority of us, we rarely have to deal with getting the exam done within a particular time frame. Like there's, there's really no specific deadline that's looming when we're working towards this. So I tend to approach this in the other direction. So here's my, my approach. And it's very similar, interestingly, or not, to the approach I take when I am creating these videos for my courses. So I go to, a, a, no big shocker here, the exam objectives. So here's my exam objectives. 
And I've got a list of bullets in these objectives that I need to know for the exam. So I just start at the beginning where uh, compare and contrast different types of social engineering techniques. First on the list is phishing. All right, well, let's learn everything we need to know about phishing. What is phishing? What would phishing look like? Uh, how can we prevent phishing on the network? Um, uh, what type of problems occur when phishing succeeds? So we learn all about phishing. OK, well, good. That one goes on my list. Let's, uh, in fact, I'll annotate this. I've got an annotation tool. We'll mark that one as done. It's green. Next on our list, smishing, which is a phishing over SMS, text message. Smishing. So that's another one we would we would take and we would learn about what is smishing. Uh, it's about SMS. How would it look? What does it ask of us? Uh, what situations will we find it? And what problems does it cause? OK, we've learned all about smishing. Next on our list, vish. So there you go. There's your there's your process for going through and understanding how do I learn these topics. And it's just taking them one at a time and learning everything you need to know about that one topic. When you know it, check it off your list. And the, the time it takes for you to learn all of these bullets will be your timeline for learning Security Plus, which means there isn't a specific timeline. On one day, you might study an entire section. You might study 20 bullets here and lock down that information. It's in your brain. You got it. Sometimes you don't have that much time. You're able to get one or two of these topics in, and then you got to go do something else because that's life. So you can check off, okay, I, I get two of them. Let's get those two done. And then the weekend shows up. Okay, it's the weekend. I can really sit through and go through a big chunk of them. So that's what I'll do on the weekend. So you could bite these off a little bit at a time a little chunk at a time, going through and use the exam objectives as your checklist. Um, that Then you know, once you get into that section done, now you go to the next section. And you just start going a little bit at a time. Um, that's that's sort of the, the question, the as the saying goes, is how do you eat an elephant uh, one bite at a time? You just take it a little bit at a time. These, this exam is an elephant. It's big. It's enormous. So, um, so just take it and take little bites and learn everything you can about that little bite and then go to the next little bite. And I think that's a much better strategic way to study, especially when we're dealing with time frames. Now, what you can't do is get distracted. So turn off the YouTube, turn off the streaming, turn off everything, get into that mode. I think after you get through about a week of studying, you kind of get into a cycle. Uh, they say you do something 21 times in a row and it becomes a habit. So get 21 times of this to be a habit uh, and, and work through those. And I think that's a, a good way to do it. I think that's, that's especially from my perspective, a great way to approach it. Um, and that may get you out of the worry of working towards a calendar because we can't always predict when this is going to happen. And by the way, it generally takes on average two to three months to study everything you need to know to take this exam. When I take exams like this, if I was to take Security Plus today, it would take me six months. Just knowing everything that goes on in my world, I'm going to need six months to study this one. So that locking this in and saying, oh, I'm going to do it in two months. I know that's just not going to work. That's not practical. So my, my recommendation to you is just take it a little bit at a time and use those objectives as your checklist. Let's do some other questions um, that are here. I've uh, got some, some others in this list. Uh, let's let's uh, first, I've got a couple here published. Let's clear those out. Don't worry, I'm, I'm keeping, keeping tabs on all of these things as we... Uh, work through them. Let's do another uh, question really more about uh, careers and where we go with some of these topics. Uh, this one, pretty good one that came in. Um, let's take this one from Jude, who asks, uh, hello, Professor Messer, another question. My background is in product management and product marketing. Very familiar. I'm looking to transition into information security. I'm also very familiar. Completed an Information Security Assurance Postgraduate Certificate and currently completing an MSc in Cybersecurity. All good things. What certifications can I also do to strengthen my resume? 
So you've you've got a pretty good background here. You didn't mention whether this this background in product management, product marketing was um, was technically related, which can certainly help you in the world of doing this. Uh, this is what whenever you focus on these things, um, it, we could give you a bunch of recommendations that are just blind recommendations. Like it would be great if you got. And uh, one of the certifications, like a CISSP from ISC Squared, it sort of fits the broad uh, set of credentials that you already have. And CISSP is one of those sort of golden certificates in the IT security arena. It's a very well-respected and often requested certificate by hiring managers. Um, you also have a lot of good practical experience and a lot of good formal education on this list too. So you've got a lot going for you. So the question, let's get down to the question though, which says, what certifications can I often do to strengthen my resume? I don't know. Because I don't know what jobs you're going to be applying to. I don't know what jobs or what employers in your area would like to see because these, these, jo these jobs in particular geographical areas have different requirements depending on where you happen to be. So the jobs that are available in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding areas have a certain set of, ex of requirements for those job descriptions. But if you go look at Dallas, Texas, or Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Los Angeles, California, you will find that the job descriptions and the job postings are very different in those different geographical areas. And that's sort of just the way it works. So I would say we need to kind of reverse our thought process here which is what jobs in your area are currently offered or posted as open positions and what and find the ones that kind of fit what you're trying to do. Maybe it's an IT security uh, analyst. Maybe it's a systems engineer. Maybe you're working for a, a security company that's creating products and you can be on that side of things. Um, with those it's important to see what they're asking for. So I think this is a really good opportunity to make your, uh, to do the research and make your list. Get a spreadsheet, start looking at jobs in your area that are, that fit, that you really believe fit, that you could get that job. That's the job you could get. Uh, okay, what type of formal education do they want? What type of industry experience are they looking for? What type of formal education would they like to see? And what type of certifications on top of that would be useful. And then, of course, what practical experience or practical knowledge of different topic products and topics would they like to see in this particular individual? So that's going to help point you in a direction. You may find that you've looked at 10 job postings in your area. All 10 of the job postings want Security Plus. Okay. Among other things, that was one that was sort of a common thread through all of those. Okay, go get your Security Plus because then you would fit a little bit better into every single one of those job postings. Maybe everybody's looking for CISSP. Maybe they're looking for a Cisco certification. Maybe they'd like a cloud-based certification. I don't know. It, it's different depending on where you look in the world, in the country and in the world. So I would tell you that, that there's probably a number of different options for certifications to help strengthen your resume. Certifications always strengthen if they really apply towards the job that you're going after. Um, but you're going to have to look and do some more research. So I hate answering a question with homework, but that's what this is. I'm giving you homework that you now have to go out and do research to answer this particular question because there is no answer. I'm in a bubble. I'm in a vacuum. I don't know what it's like where you happen to be. And I think that'd be a very good way to also become more familiar with the jobs in your area and the different companies in your area. It's remarkable what you can learn from a series of job postings, especially when you start comparing job postings from one company to another. And even more interesting, if you happen to know people at those companies, which it sounds like in your particular case, you may have some industry experience that way. Uh, I will also tell you that um, if you haven't done it already, and you probably have, make sure you have updated your LinkedIn, that it has all of this information on it, that it has a list of what you're looking for, that it has this emphasis in security. You know, LinkedIn is, um, a lot of people dismiss it as just another social media site. But for the purposes of IT 
and professional uh, ways to keep up with people that you've worked with, it is a great option. And it is kind of the de facto industry option for seeing what's going on out there in the world. Um, and it, I find it great. I help people all the time on LinkedIn that I've worked with. Now, if you've gone to my LinkedIn um, and you've seen that, you know that I don't have a lot of people that I that I follow or that I am I'm tracked with on LinkedIn because I only add people to my personal LinkedIn that I have worked with at a personal level. Um, that way, I'm able to have a very clear perspective of what's going on with the people I know, the things they're looking for, and we can keep up to date and keep track of each other much better. Um, LinkedIn is not a popularity contest. You not should not be looking for more connections. Connect with me on LinkedIn. No, we're not going to connect with you on LinkedIn. That's not what you should be doing. Go to Facebook for that. Go to Twitter for that. Go to any of the social media sites for that. But for LinkedIn, it needs to be a very strategic set of relationships and connections. That's the best way to go about using it. It's not about quantity. It's about quality, and you need to make the decisions on how the quality works there um, and how you can use that. There's a lot of people looking on LinkedIn to find people that will fit jobs that they have open, and if you're not there, they're not going to find you. So hopefully that can help you strengthen your resume and some other things along those lines. You've got a great background listed there. You've got a great formal degree listed there. Um, certifications, really. Certifications and knowing someone who works in the places that you're applying – is just that would be the icing on the cake. So work towards those lines, and I think you'd be in great shape. Let's do some more questions. Um, more, 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 more. Let's keep flipping through and flipping through and flipping through. A um, lot of great stuff that folks are sending in, by the way. There is um, there's some other things that were there um, on this list. Uh, this is one that is, well, I wouldn't say controversial, but uh, it certainly is a... Uh, one that we need to talk about, uh, especially if you're planning to take your Security Plus exam. This question from Randy asks, would you recommend a physical test center over a remote site? I've heard horror stories when others have tested at home or not a test center. Um, this is a, a topic of much discussion on the online message boards. You go out to Reddit uh, slash r slash CompTIA. They talk about this stuff all the time. And as I've mentioned in previous study groups, I personally think that if there is a testing center, a physical location that is in your nearby geographical area, that that is much, much more advantageous to take your exam there than to take your exam at home. And that those are really your two options for taking your exam. For those of you not familiar, that you can either go to a... Uh, Pearson View CompTIA approved location. It's usually at a school or university or a third party uh, training center. Uh, usually there are multiple options within your particular geographical area. Sometimes there's not. The other option you have is to take your exam at home, remote testing. And the, the challenge from CompTIA's perspective is that they want the remote testing process in your house to be just as secure as the testing process that would be at a testing center. Now, at a testing center, there's a dedicated room. There's a camera watching everybody. There's an in-person proctor who's going to check you in, check your ID, make sure you have nothing in your pockets, make sure you don't have any watches on, put your cell phones into a locker, lock everything up, take you into the room, start the exam, and say, good luck, and they, they walk out and they monitor you from the camera. At home, how do you turn your house into a secure testing center? This is my house. My, my studio is in my home. So this would never work for a test. I would have to turn off everything but one monitor, unplug all of the monitors. Uh, there's all these rules when you're at home. Uh, there has to Ideally, it is in a room with a door. It's not an open room. There could be nobody else seen on the camera walking by when you're going through this. You also have a lot of rules about what can be on the table. You can't have papers. You can't have anything that is, uh, uh, that is wired to you. You can't have headphones on. Um, there's a big list. There's an enormous list of things you have to do in your house to make it secure. And then on top of that, you have to be able to 
be seen by the camera. They're watching you on a webcam the entire time you're taking your exam and recording it. So they're looking at you. If uh, suddenly um, you you have an itch, you're like, oh, I got it. Oh, this itch right here. Let me let me oh, let me pick up this pencil that I dropped or something on the floor. There was something I needed to adjust, and I go outside the the way of my camera, and suddenly I'm not on the camera anymore. Some proctors will immediately stop the exam. It's over. Whatever you've scored so far is your score, and that's it. You're done. You're finished. So that's that's a problem because all you did was reach down and go outside the camera really quick. Uh, you can't leave the room. If you get up and leave, the exam is over. If somebody opens the door and walks behind you and goes to the other side of the room, the exam's over. <laughs> This, there's so many things that can cause the exam to be over. A dog comes in and jumps up on the table. They could cancel your exam to jail. Uh, believe it or not, jail. That's every single one of these. Believe it or not, exam is over. That's that's the situation we're in. Um, some, some proctors are pretty good with you. So one of the things you can't do on your exam is this. Hmm. Wait, I'm not doing anything. Just reading the screen. Yeah, but your hand is in front of your mouth. And you could be... It's talking into a recording device. And so they don't want you to have your hand in front of your mouth. You also can't talk during the exam, which technically speaking, you can't talk in an exam center either. That's against the rules in an exam center. But there's nobody in the room with you in the exam center shutting you down. So uh, if you did this on the exam, would you recommend a physical test center or a remote site? I've heard horror stories and other people. Oh, exam's over. What? Well, they might give you a warning. Warning, you're talking because if there is a recording me method in the room of some kind, you're effectively saying the words on the screen into the recording device. That's what the concept is behind that. That's why you can't talk. In a testing center, you can't talk because there's other people in the room. You're bothering them. Uh, same scenario. Uh, the problem that most people have with that testing at home is some proctors are super strict. And they don't give warnings sometimes. And the moment something happens, they end the exam and it's over. And by the way, you've lost your money that you paid for the exam. Not only is the exam over, you're done. you got to buy another voucher to take the exam again. Uh, up to a point. So up to a point that at the end of the exam, once you finish answering the questions and you submit, there is a short survey you have to take, sort of a demographic type survey. And you have to go through those questions, and then it tells you immediately if you passed or if you failed. Same thing as a testing center. And some people, they go, I passed. I passed the exam. And the proctor at that point, for some reason, they have, they have been given instructions that say if they ever talk or move out of the camera in the exam, it's over. Even though your exam was technically over, they, they turn it off right there and say your exam has been is ended. You are done. Yeah, but your exam already was ended. And, and in that particular case, you don't lose anything because you, you're you finished your exam. Whatever score you got on the exam is the score you got on the exam. And in fact, if they stop the exam and you had one question left and they say, you talked, your exam is over, it's not the end of the world because they will evaluate how you did so far. And whatever score you've made up to that point, they'll take that score. And if it's a passing score, you pass the exam. So most of the time, that's what they do. They will not necessarily always do that. So there's a lot more that goes wrong at home. Now, if you already understand this, you expect it, you have a, uh, you have a scenario where you know what to do if that particular thing happens, it's not going to be a surprise. You could take your exam at home knowing that those particular problems could occur, but you're ready should they happen. Um, and the scenario, of course, is what if a testing center is an hour away from you? What if it's two hours away? What if it's six hours away? That's not practical. You can't drive there and drive home. So people will not take an exam at a testing center. It's so much easier to take it at home. That would make perfect sense. So this is not an all or nothing, I'm telling you. I'm not saying you should always go to a testing center. I'm saying that I will always go to a testing center but I'm saying that depending on your particular scenario, it might make more sense to take the exam at home. But if that's the case, I would highly recommend you read very 
everything. You read everything that's on the CompTIA website about taking your exam at home. You read through all of the technical requirements. You read through all of the rules and regulations, and you become very, very familiar with them so that there aren't any surprises on day one. Now, on top of that, people have, have prepared for their exam. They set everything up the way they were supposed to. They put all of their webcams in place. There's a test program that you can run weeks before to make sure that your system is going to work properly for the exam. And they sit down to take the exam, and the camera doesn't work. It worked on the testing program. Well, it's not working now. So there's a whole, OK, let's reboot. Well, the, now we're in the middle of a test, trying to get the camera to work. The, cam, the time is counting down while you're rebooting. You're losing time on your exam because you're dealing with technical problems with the camera working properly. And if it does that two or three times, they'll cancel your exam, and then you're out the money for whatever reason. I know it doesn't. Some of these things don't seem fair, don't seem right, but that seems to be what's happening. I know that CompTIA is working very hard at trying to make the process more streamlined to make it easier, but they don't manage this process. It's a third party. It's Pearson View that manages this process. It's really up to them to implement any changes, fixes, corrections, and anything else. So you're almost there's three people involved in getting this done. That's just the right number of people to not get anything done, isn't it? So that's that's the scenario you run into. Yes, you can take it at home. I think that's a great option for many people. I think it's an easier option to go to a testing center where you don't have to worry about any of that. You just walk in, take your exam, walk out, done. That's that's what it is. So that's that's what I and people in chat room were saying, well, what if my test was wrongfully canceled? You open a ticket with CompTIA. You ask them to review their materials, to look at the video. You give your case on why you think it was wrongfully canceled. And then you request respectfully if you could provide me with another voucher considering these problems, this technical issue, this whatever it happened to be. Don't be insulting. Don't say this was ridiculous. Don't say I'm going to sue you. You just say, here's what happened. Be very factual. And can I please get another voucher? And maybe things will work out okay. Uh, there are situations where people have managed to make that happen. So that's what I would recommend for you as well. It's a, it's a, a, a complicated issue. There's no right or wrong answer on it. But it is something that you have to think about if you're planning to take your exam at home. Uh, I know we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to get a couple more questions in because there's just so many that have come in here. And being able to work through that. Uh, speaking of a testing center, this is sort of applies uh, along the same way since we're talking about this. Um, this question is uh, from Adrian who asks, what type of environment can I expect in a testing center? What are these places like? Most of the time, and, and ideally, every testing center is going to be very, very similar in its style and structure. There's a very formal set of processes that are provided by Pearson View to these third parties because these sites are not owned by Pearson View. They are owned by a third party who simply has a Pearson View testing center in their facility. Um, and, and it's one that probably is used for many different testing services. Um, the best ones I tend to find are at community colleges. They've got a good budget. They've got plenty of space and room to have a nice testing room. It's comfortable. It's well lit. There's modern computers and screens and keyboards and mice, and it works great. Uh, there are some testing environments, though, I've walked into at a testing center that were just awful. I've mentioned this one before, and I think it's worth talking about again, is that I went to take a test in Miami. It was a test at a testing center that I was working near the airport in at MIA, and I there was a testing center right around the corner. I thought, that's very convenient. I'll go during lunch. I'll take my test. I'll come back. F fantastic. I go to the testing center. And it's uh, kind of this strip mall kind of two-story place. It's upstairs. I go up these rickety stairs into the place. It's a small little room that's in here. Some of you that have been near the airport in Miami on, on 36th Street, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there is, uh, it's kind of run down. Uh, and it's a testing center that primarily is there to test pilots for certain things that they do. I know nothing about the aviation industry, as you can probably tell. But there's things that they obviously have to do with testing on a testing center. This was a, there was a desk on one side of the room. There was a closet in front of me when I walked in the door. But the closet, the door was gone from the closet. 
And inside the closet was a desk. I'm not, not making this up. With a monitor and a chair. The chair was sort of sitting outside the closet. And they had found the desk that would kind of fit perfectly inside the closet. And so I, I checked in. I sat down at the chair connecting here to the the testing lab center closet. Um, and I took my exam. There's a person right there answering the phones. It's not a closed-in room. Um, there, I'm taking the exam. I finish it. Uh, I think I passed. I think I got through it. I think I did. Um, and then I, I got the printout and that time they printed out your results. These days, all your results are available online. You don't have to worry about getting a printout and, uh, and left. And I thought not going to do that one again, although I passed not a great experience for doing this. And that's why I'll, I'll give you a little insight into my exam hacks ebook. I tell you that if you have the time and it's something you can do, Go to the testing center before you book it and ask them, walk in the door and say, hey, can I just see what your testing center is like? Can I get an idea? I'm planning to take my exam and I'd like to see if this is a good place to take it. Every time I've ever done that, they said, sure, come on in, I'll show you. There's a room, it's got a glass, you can look in uh, or they'll even, if nobody's in there testing at the time, they'll let you in the room. Like, oh yeah, we got flat panels, nice mice, keyboard, it's air conditioned, it's quiet, this is a quiet room. And you can make a decision on whether that's a good place to go or not. So they, are, they, are, they can vary widely, even though there are some very specific quality requirements that are listed on the, the, on, on the um, Pearson View requirements. They're not always the same. So uh, that's, I, I think, checking out a testing center prior to going to the testing center is a super good idea because you will know very quickly if this is somewhere you really want to take a test or maybe it's a place that doesn't make any sense at all and we need to get out of here right away before the roof falls in. Um, the, it's remarkable. Uh, some people in the chat room were saying, yep, I've had similar situations. Not all testing centers are created equal. Uh, they will let you enter the testing center sometimes if uh, or the testing room if nobody's in there at the moment. But most of them have a glass or they have a camera and you can see what it's like. And quite honestly, once you walk in the door of these places, you can kind of get a vibe as to how the testing is testing is set up there. And other places, Ed says in the chat room that uh, the testing center has earplugs and sound-canceling headphones. Wow. I'd like to go to that testing center. Mine never have those. Um, so that's, that's what I would, that's what I would recommend is check it out. Make sure it is a good one to go with. So that's, that's a super important to make that happen. Let's do some more questions. Um, other questions that are here. Um, so this is, uh, a pretty good one. Um, so, uh, this is, this is sort of, uh, uh more of a, a logistics question, but we'll, we'll answer it anyway. How do we sign up for my weekly Security Plus pop quiz emails? I find these really helpful. Is there a link to sign up? There is. It's right on the main website of professormesser.com. Let me see if I can pop open a new browser window on my side and show you where this is. Um, if you go to the front page, uh, there is the main part of the site, and there's a sidebar on the right side. On the main page of the website, you scroll, gosh, can you tell I've been looking around for new uh, luggage. And then there's uh, clicks here for the Discord chat is, uh, link is usually there. But then there's another one, and this may not always be there. You may have to refresh uh, for the daily and weekly pop quizzes. Now, another thing you can do if this is Security Plus is I have an option underneath the Security Plus graphic or under the Security Plus pull-down menu for Start Here. Uh, the start here, yeah, I don't need, I don't need luggage. Seriously, thanks, thanks, Google Ads. You're so good at knowing what I need. If you go to the start here, though, I list out everything that can help you with your studies. So it can be study groups, the chat, and the free weekly pop quiz. And there's a link there to sign up. So everything you would ever need for Security Plus is on this page. I just put everything on one page. It's the start here page. Um, and everything that I offer, everything that's available is on this page. Free free things are on the page. Uh, premium products are on the page. It's all there. It's all on the website. So that's what I would recommend you do as well. Um, thank you for the question. 
let's keep going, even though I know I'm way over time here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Mrs. Professor Messer you made me do this so that she won't get angry that I'm taking too long. The uh, questions on here, um, this, is a, this is a pretty good one because um, this is sort of a, a common thing that we sometimes will, will run into. Um, this is from Cameron who asks, Hi, Professor. I recently obtained my Security Plus certification, but it seems extremely unlikely I can get a security job because it's just too competitive. I'm looking at an IT support specialist position now. How long do you think I'll have to stay in this position until I can move up into security? So this is probably the one thing that I will tell people over and over and over again. And I don't think the industry has quite picked up on it. Or if they have, they've sort of ignored it. I think it, that's probably more likely the case, which is the IT security area of, of information technology, that security section, because IT is big. We're talking about uh, workstations, operating systems, servers, which is Windows and Linux. We're talking about Mac OS. We're talking about cloud-based technologies, database administration, um, data center uh, administration, you've got email, and we and the list goes on. I mean, IT is just a big animal. It's There's a lot going on here. So whether you be network administration, security administration, it just goes on and on and on and on. There's so many different niches in the world of IT. And one of those niches is security. Security is a significant and and prominent these days section of information technology because everything begins and ends on the security side. And having been in the cybersecurity side of things, that's pretty common to see that. What I tell people, though, is that there are not a lot of positions available in IT security that are start from zero knowledge positions, at least not relative to the rest of IT. The rest of IT tends to have starting positions for someone who has no knowledge in the industry. And it's not unusual, and you often see this when we talk about these certifications, is you're getting the cert so you can get your foot in the door. What is that foot in the door? In many cases, it's a help desk position. But it doesn't have to be. If you are in a big geographical area where it's a big city, you might have a network operations center or a NOC. So you could get started on the networking side with what technically is sort of a help desk for the network. That's what a network operations center is. We just don't call it a help desk. We call it a, uh, a network analyst or a network technician one. You know, there's whatever job role they title they plan to put on that. Um, and so that, that gets you into the networking side with zero knowledge, but you really are doing triage. You're really answering phones, looking at emails, looking at tickets and assigning those out. There's a similar thing on the security side a security operations center or a SOC. Uh, the SOCs also have these start from ground zero positions that are commonly available. And those can, again, is all about triage. You're answering phones, you're answering emails, you're looking at tickets, you're assigning different things, you're looking for alarms and alerts, and you're deciding what to do with those. So that is that is sort of the the, the grunt work of that particular area. But I would say the vast majority of jobs that are available that are truly entry level into IT, no experience, you're getting into information technology, those are commonly generic help desk positions. They are service desk positions. They are kind of the corporate or, or organizational help desk position. There are vastly more numbers of those jobs available than something that might be a zero knowledge position in networking or security. That's because security requires you to already have a very good foundational knowledge in many of these other things. I often say that you need a very good knowledge in different operating systems. You need to know Windows very well. You need to know Linux very well. You need to know Mac OS well enough. Uh, depending on the organization you're with, or you may need to know that very well. Um, then you need to know a lot about networking. What about switching? What about routing? What about VPNs? And then I'm layered on top of that, maybe a foundational or at least a basic understanding of some of the security technologies, which Security Plus fits very well with that. Once you have accumulated all of that knowledge, 
This will obviously be something more than a week's worth of your time. We're talking years of experience. You are finally at a point where you could move into an entry-level security position. Now, entry-level in security is not entry-level with no knowledge. It's entry-level into security, which means you already have knowledge in operating systems, networking, and some of these other technologies. So I tell people that you'll see a lot of organizations that try to get you to get a degree in cybersecurity, uh, get this cybersecurity certification, cybersecurity, 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 and then you get a job in security, except you're going to find that it's incredibly competitive because everybody is out there with no knowledge in security trying to get a job in security. So it becomes a little more complicated to make that happen. But if you've already been in the industry and you've already been doing the knowledge of, you've got a good knowledge of Windows, you've been administering Active Directory, you've been designing and planning and implementing Windows services, uh, you've been working with networking, you've configured switches, you're familiar with routers, you can troubleshoot a network at an instant, you can look at packets and understand what they're telling you, and you have some foundational knowledge and security, now you're ready to move up into the ranks. And you will find it is not as competitive there as it is down at the lower levels because you have a lot more people with no knowledge fighting over very few positions. Whereas once you have that knowledge, it is a much more structured entry level into security. And there's much fewer people that are fighting for those same positions. I And it's not it's not a 10-year thing. People in chat room going, does that take 10 years? Is that going to be a long time? Not necessarily. I mean, you can get a very good, not, and it depends on where you work, uh, but you'll, people sometimes will tell you, oh, I work somewhere, and I swear I worked five years worth of education. I got five years worth of knowledge in one year because it was just crazy. And MSPs are like that, managed service providers. There's some uh, corporate environments that I've been in that were ridiculous that way. Um, and there, in those cases, you learn a lot in a very short period of time. And so you could, you could gain a lot of knowledge in Windows by applying yourself, getting certifications, working somewhere on it all full time, and really, really, really pushing yourself. I got to tell you, the more you push yourself in the first three to five years of your IT career, the better tra 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 trajectory you're going to get for the next five to 10 years in your, and just keep doing that. The more you work on the fundamentals, the more you work on your learning, the more you work on your certifications, the more you work on understanding what's going on under the hood of these operating systems and networks, the better positioned you're going to be going forward. And you could do this in two to three years. If you really apply yourself and be very, very uh, proactive about learning these technologies and then even moving from place to place, you know, I know that's a very short time frame. Usually we're on the three year rule. You work somewhere three years, you move to another company. You work there three years, you move to another organization. You work there three years. We often think of it as that three year rule, but it's not necessarily that way. Um, you could, you could work really hard for a year and a half and then move to another organization. And I think you'd be pretty good. So try to get all of that experience under your belt and trying to make that happen. Uh, and I think there you're going to be better positioned for security. Now, I'll get emails all the time from people that say, you said there's no positions for security for entry level, but I just got one and you're so wrong. You are correct. I was so wrong there. But, but my, I actually <laughs> said there's relatively few positions available compared to the rest of IT, but there are positions available. And if you have the right strategy and you go through the process of learning what you need to learn, you get a, a good formal education, industry certifications, you have some practical experience and you know someone who works there, you will have a better chance of getting those very competitive entry level jobs than perhaps someone else. So that's why I tell people all the time, don't, don't necessarily think that it's a one path, that you're on a rail and you must follow my path to get there. There's not a path in IT. Everybody takes a different path in IT. There's way too many different options available for you not to. So I think it's pretty important that you find what works for you, that you continue to apply yourself. I think maybe people don't understand that about IT either. With IT, you are constantly, constantly learning. 
throughout your entire career, there will never be a point where you're not learning. You're always learning something new. The industry is changing under our feet. We not only have to remember and keep track of everything that we've done up to this point, but there's new technologies coming out all the time. So you constantly have to be learning those. And of course, there's all the stuff you don't know yet anyway that's been around for 30 years. So we're learning, for instance, on your Network Plus, you have to learn about Spanning Tree. Spanning Tree's been around forever. Well, you still need to know it. And you have to know all these new things too. So we're just adding on to the list of things. It just gets bigger and bigger. Now, fortunately, some things fall off the list. We don't have to learn about token ring. We don't have to learn about Windows 95. You know, those things fall off the list. But we do have to know about Windows 11. And we do have to know about SD-WAN. So we add things to the list. So that's the challenge you're going to constantly run into. But I will tell you, the more you apply yourself, the more you learn about those technologies, the more you do to make yourself smarter and more knowledgeable in these niches, the more marketable you're going to be, the more uh, chance you're going to have at getting that next position that you're looking for. And it will happen very quickly the more you apply yourself. It's all about time at this point. And moving up and, and making that happen is a pretty important thing. So I would say that if you're in an IT support specialist position now and you've got your Security Plus certification, these are, these are good things to start building on. So you've got an IT support position. What are you supporting? Are you supporting Windows, Linux, uh, other operating systems? To what level? Are you, are you then designing these? Because that's really the next step. You know when you're doing well if you have more than troubleshooting that you're doing, you're actually planning new deployments. And you know what the advantages and disadvantages are for the different decisions that you're making during the planning process. That's how you really know uh, at, that that's working, that, that you're really working through the details of that. And I think that's a good way to approach this and really understand how you can get from ground zero to all the way to where you'd like to be. And another great thing about this, by the way, is that in the industry and the things that we do in the industry, there's no upper level. We just keep moving up and moving up and moving up and moving up. There's always somewhere to go higher, even in the technical ranks. So you can be uh, an expert in your field, you know, in 10 to 15 years, and you are up at a very nice level, making very good money with lots of flexibility and plenty of benefits because you worked hard on those first years building the foundation. And once you've done that, everything else is, makes it relatively easy to add on to later on in your career. Recommend very highly that you approach things in that way. Maybe that can give you some ideas about where you might want to go in your industry. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not a rail. So you have to decide what that path is going to be for you and break those down. Uh, I'm going to take a question quickly from the chat room, too. Uh, the question, uh, this is sort of broadly um, and, and working with those. Um, Igor says, do you have a, um, a future, do you see a future in a work-at-home scenario for years to come? I, I don't know that we see a future at work-at-home for months to come, quite honestly. Uh, in The industry sort of made a quick turnaround, didn't they? Everybody was working at home. We're going to work at home. Work at home is the way to go. Uh, our, we, we were able to keep things running. We put in an extensive infrastructure for work at home. We got VPNs up and running. We have multi-factor authentication. It's very secure. People have gotten used to it. We know how to work that way. And now everyone's being asked to come back into the office. So I'm finding probably more often than not now we're seeing a lot of the new positions that are being offered are they've moved from it's no longer work at home. How about hybrid? They're gonna they're gonna ease us back into it, is what they're doing. How about how about hybrid? Now, what's interesting, and people have mentioned this in the chat room, some organizations just do work at home. But by the way, those organizations were doing work at home before COVID. So the work at home positions were out there already. I worked with lots of people who were uh, 24, uh, 24 by 7 or, or at least their entire workday was all work at home. They never went into an office because they were break fix technical people that were on a phone call anyway. Well, have a phone call at home rather than having the phone call in the office. It was the same thing. Now, what, what companies have run into, however, of course, and this is sort of the problem, and, and we can talk about whether this is a problem that we need to solve or not, is 
we in this industry, but or in the in the country before COVID, we built these enormous buildings with desks in them, and everybody went into that big building, and that's where we would work. Now, instantly, everybody's at home, but you've still got this building that you the company either owns or is leasing, and it is not an a small amount of money that they're leasing this from. And if people aren't in that building, all of the other businesses around that building, like for lunch, dry cleaners, uh, things you, where you go to get all of the tasks done during the day, those people aren't making any money because you're not in the building. The building owners aren't making any money. That It's all this trickle-down problem. So do you let the entire downtown or where the section of where this building is, do you let that entire area fall apart? Or do you start bringing it up again and getting the economy going again? Now, I realize that's not your specific problem. You're an IT person. You're not in charge of the economy of the country. But the people that are trying to make something on the investment that they've created, specifically these office buildings, um, they're trying to figure out a way to either partially take advantage of the assets that they have accumulated there or find a way to ease us out of them. And a lot of companies have done that. They've eased out of the buildings, but others are trying to make people come back full time. Um, I don't think that we are doing more remotely than we have done in the past. I think, if anything, companies have started to pull people back more. It's harder to find the 24 by 7 full-time uh, at-home kind of jobs. My particular career is an interesting one because I had an office at home, but I would really maybe see that once a week, that my job was one where I went to other people's office. So I would travel most of the time visiting other folks where they happen to be. And that obviously has changed a bit through the years. And my I don't do that any longer, but it's something where um, I was not work at home, but I was not at I, I wasn't, I had an office at home, but I wasn't work at home. I was work everywhere else, but I didn't go into an office. I went into somewhere every different every day. Maybe that's a good type of job. Those jobs are out there too, where you just travel around. I, there, I used to work with people, their territory, they did not work at home. They would visit customers and their territory in some cases was one building in New York City. That's, they only went to that building. And inside that building, it was an enormous building with tons of customers. And maybe it was one company or maybe it was multiple companies. That was their territory. And if something happened to that building, they were responsible for taking care of whatever people needed in that building. And I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Mine, mine was a similar role, except it was a state. You know, I had to deal with everything in Florida. So I could be in Tallahassee one day, I could be in Orlando another day, I could be in Miami the other day. And that's a little bit bigger than a single building in New York City, but the same idea. That's the territory that I was in. There's jobs like that. Maybe that's something that would interest you. Um, those jobs are out there as well. Every company is a little bit different. Every company has a different style of doing, the, doing these things. I found that prior to COVID, it seemed like the communications companies were much more work at home centric because it was people that need first it was an enormous organization you know there's 50,000 employees uh, it was just an enormous number that are there but the employees that were there uh, they didn't want it in an office they're like we don't need you in an office we got way too many people as it is and all you do is you're on a phone fixing things that are broken you're on a conference call with folks you get stuck on a bridge and you're there with a bunch of other people, and you're waiting for that one person who's allowed into the room to go in there and have you turned it off and turned it back on again. You know, that's what you do. And it took takes three hours to get that done, and then you go to the next three-hour thing. You hop on a different bridge. Well, you can do that at home. In fact, it's much better to do that at home because you're listening most of the time. You're not actually doing. Eventually, hey, James, can you have a look at that switch? Oh, oh yes, okay. Let me look at that switch. Okay, I see it's uh, it's enabled now. Uh, are you seeing the, I'm going to ping over the other side. Yep, just pinged it. Everything looks good here. Are you seeing that? Yep, it's up. Okay, we're done with this one. Close the ticket. I'm off to the next thing. 
oh, that took three hours for me to type in ping. Those are real jobs, by the way. That's a real thing. Um, and But those are jobs that are very commonly at home. Now, if you're part of a uh, project management, product management, marketing group, you probably need to be in the office with other people that are doing a similar thing so that you can bounce ideas off of each other. That's sort of the way the industry works. So I guess it also depends on which job you're looking at and how you would do this. And if people are in the office and you're an IT professional who needs to support people that are working, you may need to be in the office because they're in the office. So there you go. There's your there's your challenges with at home. We don't know which directions is going to be. I'm seeing the trend more towards going back in the office. Uh, other people in the chat room are saying, I don't know. I see a lot of jobs that are still remote. There are still jobs remote. Absolutely. I'm just seeing a lot more of them are starting to lean towards telling you it's work at home. And then we've had a change of heart. We've made a decision corporately. We've decided to implement full time at work or we're doing a hybrid mode or something changed. And I see a lot of changes happening right now. So keep your keep your eyes open, have an idea, keep a, a good feel for what's happening in your particular area. And maybe that's something you can work through. Maybe it's not something you want to work through. Maybe you want a different job where it's completely remote. If you can find one, those are those are pretty good places to go. And I think that's a, a good direction anyway. If anybody's ever trying to get to that point, uh, it could be a challenge. So figure out what works for you. And I think that's the, the best way to approach it. I think that's probably a good place to stop. I'm way over time anyway. I want to thank you all for hanging in with me, though. There were a number of super chats that went through. I apologize for not catching all of them. Uh, there was a, a ratty social uh, a year on from passing Security Plus after buying notes and exams combo. I'm moving to my second cyber job. Started as a SOC analyst level one. See, I told you. It can happen. Thank you for that $5 super chat. And I think that uh, that comment about your job and what you did was probably even more important than that. It was worth the $5 right there. Thank you so much for that story. And congratulations on your Security Plus and your career. I uh, also want to thank uh, Thin in the chat room for, he says, uh, $4.99. Thank you for your videos. Past my Security Plus this past Tuesday. Congratulations on your new Security Plus, And thank you also for the $4.99 Super Chat. There were probably others in this list that I have completely missed. Let me apologize right away. I try to catch all the Super Chats as they're coming through. I don't currently have a great way to catch all of them, but I sure appreciate your support. And thank you so much for con your contribution, not only financially, but your contribution in the chat room for everybody else here who's going through the same thing that you went through as well. Thanks for joining us for the study group. It's been a great month. We look forward to seeing you on many others. Make sure you check our website. And if you want to follow us over on Discord, we're always over there. You can find us at professormesser.com slash Discord. And of course, there's always another study group around the corner. If you want to know when the next one is going to be, check our calendar at professormesser.com slash calendar. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time on the Security Plus study group.